Good evening, everyone. I now call to order the meeting of the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Tarpa Springs on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022 at 6 p.m. We received an email from Commissioner Terrapani that he will not be able to attend this meeting tonight due to the health reasons. We need a motion to excuse him. Motion excuse. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Vadigiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? Thank you. We also need a roll call for the meeting. Chair Lahuzis? Here. Vice Chair Carr? Here. Commissioner Terrapani is absent and excused. Commissioner Donovan? Here. Commissioner Vadigiotis? Here. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is to authorize execution of parking lot lease agreement on Court Street. City Attorney, do you have any comments on the lease before we go to Mr. Lecouris? Uh No, Mayor, I've, I've reviewed it and made the changes. Um, it is very similar to the lease agreement that we have on the other parcel of uh, property that is next door, so I don't have any additional comments, but I have reviewed it and approved it. Thank you. Staff report, Mr. Lecouris. Yes, this is something we've been trying to get before you for a year. And to save my voice, I'm just gonna have Karen come up and introduce it and then we'll answer any questions. Thank you, Karen Lemons, Economic Development Manager. Um, as the city manager was saying, this is uh, a lease for the east, uh, the western portion of the parking lot. We already have the lease agreement for the eastern portion that was approved uh, about a year ago. Ideally, we would have liked to have brought them two together, but this one took a little bit more time to negotiate. Um, as the city attorney said, the lease has the same cost terms as the lease for the um, eastern portion of the lot. The annual rent is 12000 a year, payable in monthly installments of 1000 And if approved, the term would begin February 1st of this year and terminate January 31st of 2032. The site provides an additional 37 parking spaces. Um, the eastern portion of the lot contains 31. So we're getting six more spots uh, for the same cost and with both portions of the lot um, under approval, the city will be providing an additional 68 spots for the downtown area. Um, these spaces are important for us. I think we all know we need more downtown parking, um, both for commerce, the spots will provide additional parking that makes it easier for people to come downtown. If it's easier to park when you come downtown, they may come more often. Um, our special events continue to grow so the lot can be used not only for uh, visitor parking, but we could also use it for vendor parking. A lot of the vendors have trucks with trailers that may take up two or three on-street parking spots or spots in our municipal lots. So using these, this lot, we'll be able to provide more space for people who come to the events to be able to park closer. And then events at Craig Park, um, this can help alleviate parking at Craig Park, for example, the Fine Arts Festival, and I'm sure the neighborhood would appreciate that. And then finally, securing any additional parking downtown will be helpful for us in the future. We have additional restaurants and retail stores that open. Um, in addition, uh, we're talking about the, um, the redevelopment of the West Tarpon Avenue Spring Bayou lot. There's been discussion of potentially moving the Safford House there. So anything that happens on that space would, would need additional parking. So this will help us with that. Um, the lease and the conceptual design are included in your packet. Um, for your reference, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Lemons. We're going to go to public comments. Do we have any public comments on this item? <coughs> Good evening, Mike Geisner, 1515 Riverside Drive. I reviewed all of the um, uses for this, so my only question is, um, will there be allowed overnight parking? And if so, why? Because that was not anything in the backup material. So I understand it's very helpful to have this for events and for uh, commerce and for people dining. It, I'm encouraged to have it for all those reasons. I'm just curious if that was a consideration for overnight parking. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments on this item? I hear none. Uh, the chair will retain a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Likuris, I believe this price is fair and I'm supporting it. It's the same price as we uh, 
had before. Uh, with the addition 37 parking spaces, that brings it to 68 parking spaces, as, as Mrs. Lemon stated. And I believe we're doing well in downtown, but uh, uh, parking for the sponge ducks, uh, the business community there, we're not doing so well. Mr. Lacourus, this is an area we need to, uh, to work on for the sponge ducks. This is one of the uh, objectives that we have. So thank you. Vice Mayor, do you have a comment? Yeah, I've got a couple comments. Um, Karen, was this uh, discussed as a purchase versus lease? I mean, was that discussed with the business, um, the property owner at all? Um, it was just discussed as a lease. Okay. Um, I, mean, I mean, from my stance, it, it's, I'm happy to support this tonight. Uh, I mean, they did pay $180,000 for it a few years back. I know it's worth more than that today. Yeah. Um, he did it. I, I did bring that up at the beginning, and they weren't in, the family was not interested in, the, in a purchase. Okay, great. Um, just to be something aware of. Um, and then the poles, the street poles are going to match the rest of an historic, uh, historic district. And we'll also correct the, the other parking lot, too. Okay. And then um, for special events, it's not going to be, no one else is going to use it. It's going to be used for a public parking, right? It's not going to be like sublease to the Boys Club or, or uh, Boy Scouts or something like that. It's going to be open for public parking. Yeah, it'd be a municipal lot. So okay. we'll be using it as a municipal lot either for visitors or <laughs> what we do now is we, the, the portion that we already have, we use for vendor parking. So uh, we'll, we can talk with the merchants and determine if they'd like to use a portion of it for the vendor parking. Okay, understood. Um, I mean, I would echo what the mayor said as well, too. Parking in the sponge docks is important, but I would also stress the fact that parking is still a shortage in, in downtown. Um, a parking garage is something that we've discussed many times, but we haven't really made any successful uh, approaches for it. So I do believe it's something we need to discuss further in future meetings here. Thank you. Commissioner Dobbs, do you have a comment? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with you guys that we still need to pursue more public parking down in the docks, but uh, I think this is absolutely something to celebrate. I want to thank uh, Mr. LaCourse and Ms. Lemons for your effort on this. Um, I think it's an absolute bargain for the additional 37 spaces, so thank you guys. Mr. Kears, do you have a comment? Uh, I, I, I think um, as far as uh, parking at the sponge docks, um, I think that over this next year, we're going to see a lot more of the land that has been historically uh, parking developed for something else, and we really need to get ahead of that. I'm not sure of an approach yet, but that's something for the city manager and his staff to bounce some ideas off and, and bring it back to us. But um, I don't think it's an issue of um, should we. I think it's an issue of we need to do it because, as I said, land has become very valuable, and people are finding other uses uh, that are more uh, uh, beneficial to them than using it for parking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no more comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Chair Carr? Yes. Chair Lujusis? Yes, thank you. Before we go to the item number two, the display here that has no names, uh, the only thing I have is one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, I don't know who has number one. Would you hit number one? I hit. I'm my my on's right now. Okay, so you're number four. Attorney's number one. Always number one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that. Costa, would you hit yours, please? I'm sorry. Would, would you hit the uh, the button? Wait. Okay, number two. I quit a you. I think this one's yours. Oh. Yeah, I got that. Would you hit yours? That's five. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Now we got names. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to item number two, which is the CRA resolution 2022-01, budget resolution for fiscal year 2022. I'd like to ask our city attorney to read the resolution. Thank you, Mayor. This is CRA resolution 2022-01, a resolution of the Community Redevelopment Agent of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for the fiscal year 2021 
2021-2022. That was a reading of the CRA Resolution 2021-01 by title only. Thank you, staff report, Mr. Herring. Uh, good evening, Mayor Commissioners. Budget Resolution 2022-01 is being brought before for, for budgeted items from fiscal year 2021 that were in process but not completed as of September 30th, 2021. The items to bring forward were approved and budgeted in fiscal year 2021. All of the items I've listed in the cover letter. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? No comments? The chair will detain a motion. So moved. Second. Public comments, I mean, commission comments. Mr. Harry, I just wanna no. thank you for having the meeting with me discussing uh, this budget resolution and transferring the CRA funds from 2020 to 22. I really appreciate that and uh, thank you for all the work that you do. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other commission comments? No commission comments, roll call please. Commissioner Vadigiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Chair Farr? Yes. Chair Elizis? Yes. Well, that concludes the CRE meeting, and we're going to go to staff comments. Police chief? Uh, no comments, sir. City attorney? No comments. City manager? Yes, we are. Um, there's been some items requested for a CRA meeting. Obviously, with this going to the beginning of the agenda, and plus we didn't think we were have a full uh, board tonight, there will probably be at least a CRA meeting on the first meeting of February and possibly the second because there's some items um, that wants to be placed on. So if any anyone else has some items um, to put on the uh, CRA agenda um, for February when the 5th is the meeting or first meeting, the 12th, the 5th, no, the 8th, for February 8th to, to let me know. Uh, and we'll kind of gauge by what the regular, I'm not sure what the regular agenda and items are going to be. So we'll kind of gauge. Um, that's why we might have to have two CRA meetings, a meeting the 8th and, and then a meeting on the 22nd, um, depending on the length of the regular meeting, because obviously we want to try to get it in the time frame. So let me know if there's items uh, that we may want to address in February. Okay. City Clerk? I have no comments, thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Carr? No comments. Commissioner Donovan? No comments, thank you, Mayor. Commissioner Batikuras? No, none for me, Mayor, thank you. I have some that I, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Congressman Billy Rackus and everyone involved for continued efforts for uh, funding for the Anchor Dragon. We just received good news on the possibility for us to receive additional funding for the outcuts of the Anchor River. This is something that we'll be trying for a long time, looks like we have it now. Uh, also, I'd like to thank our city staff, the sponsors, the organ organizations, and St. Nicholas Cathedral for making the twin ceremony with Hanya a great success. Especially, I'd like to thank uh, our commission for uh, the ongoing support to the Sister City program and our uh, Sister City committee. Um, Mr. Liqueurs, thank you for the priority list that you provide us at the, the list that I requested. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share with us, Mr. Liqueurs? I just want to remind you on those projects, and again, they're, they're for the public too. We have our project list that we update, and it's not only for the commission, but for the, the public to view. Um, if there's anything else, I know Bob Robertson sent you an email. Um, if there's anything, any project or anything that we haven't covered on there, and you'd like us to keep a running track of our progress um, of those things, please let myself or Bob Robertson know, and we'll add them to those list of, of the projects that we're working on and Absolutely. some that are a little delayed for those priorities. So, so if, if you please send them or call us and talk about them and we wanna try to get everything on there so not only the commission but the public can go to that page and look and uh, see where we are. Again, we're still, finding a lot of delays on materials. Um, one simple example was the flagpole at Sunset Beach. We couldn't get, a, the, it was just a simple pulley problem and we couldn't get the pulley in and it you know, stayed down and we almost thought about having to get a new flagpole because we couldn't get the pulley parts. So parts, poles, equipment, 
um, we are just having a lot of problems. Um, and of course, all of our jobs, our construction sites you see, every one of them are not only having problems with equipment, but some of our construction sites and our projects, the workers are all going through this Omicron COVID thing and the crews, why, why you see no crews working a lot of time is their crews are wiped out or on quarantine and stuff. So we've got a lot of issues we're doing. We'll try to keep it up on that project list. But again, if any of them aren't on there, um, please let us know and we'll be glad to put them on there. And, <laughs> and there are still, we want to get some firmer updates on some of the dates on some of them. Um, but um, when some of these issues clear a little bit, we hope to tighten up further when we say spring, when we say that, we hope to try to tighten them up to a month or a little closer. So if someone's asked, we're not saying, well, it's spring of 22, it's, you know, whatever the month is we're hoping for. So we're gonna try to refine that over the next month also um, to try to give a good account of when these projects can go forward. Thank you, Mr. Lickers. I'd like to ask the commission if we uh, have any questions regarding the priority list. Uh, I'd like to uh, put, I'd like to place this item on the agenda for discussion if you all have any questions to do that. Um, do you want to put that on, uh, do you have questions that you want, you think we should put that on the agenda? For the agenda for? To discuss the uh, priority list of yeah. the projects. No, that it, no, I was just gonna say, I, I think the project list is great. Um, there's always details that people who live around those projects um, would like some additional information as far as specific time frames and things. and. And um, I, I'm not sure that that should be included on there, but, but any additional information would be very helpful in that regard. Um, generally, again, people don't know that there's a project list out there like this, and, and I think we need to continue um, promoting that as far as that information being there and, 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 and kind of putting residents' at, uh, minds at rest. And I understand the difficulties and the challenges that um, the city's going through right now, at least with the three infrastructure projects right now. Um, I hear about it on a routine basis, but um, as far as the priorities go, is that what you're asking for, Mayor? I, I think this is, this is gonna be part of the, um, the workshop or the town meeting here uh, in the future, I would say, right? And we're gonna have the voting software associated with that so you could vote from your seat. Is that, you're asking for something separate to that? Yes, that's not the same thing you thought. Not sure that I've got oh, any. Don't need anything. Do we just you guys? You guys okay the way it is? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. No, okay. I don't have anything to add specific to that. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Okay. Well, the uh, the meetings adjourn at six eighteen p.m. We have to wait to six thirty before we begin the BOC meeting. Good night and happy new year. No good night. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> <laughs> at six thirty. Yes, thank you, Tom.
could do that and pass them down. If <coughs> I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarpur Springs on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. And as you know, we, we Commission Terrapani is absent today due to the uh, health reasons and we need a motion. Motion to excuse. Second. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Vatikiotis. Yes. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Carr. Yes. Mayor Lahuzis. Yes, thank you. Ms. Jacobs will also need a roll call for the meeting. Mayor Lahuzis. Yes. Vice Mayor Carr. Here. Commissioner Terrapani is absent and excused. Commissioner Donovan. Here. Commissioner Vatikiotis. Here. Tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Kurt Snare from the St. Timothy Lutheran Church. If you please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Lord be with you. Most holy creator God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, for the gift of your constant presence with us. We thank you for this town that you've called us to steward and care for, not only this place, but these people as well. We pray for your wisdom upon our leaders as they govern, give them wise counsel and strengthen them, that this might be a place that brings glory and praise to you. We pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we go to our special presentation, I'd like to remind to everyone that at 7.30, the public hearing portion of the meeting will start. Once the public hearing portion is completed, we will continue the meeting from where we left off. Also, uh, I'd like to remind to everyone that based on the city rules and procedures, all public comments must be directed only to the chair of the meeting in a professional manner with respect without a personal attack. Also, cheering and clapping is not permitted during the debate. And now I'd like to invite uh, the uh, principal of Tarbert High School, Ms. Fowlitas, to give us a presentation. Yep, this is fine. Right here, so. Do you need help for your presentation, PowerPoint presentation? I think I sent it to a representative from Ms. Jacobs' office. Yeah. Did I get the, the PowerPoint? This came down. I'm not sure where you went. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. It's a pleasure to see you. Mark, excuse me. Mark, okay. are you there? I think they're working on the... They're working on it? They're working on the... Okay. Okay, good. Oh, here we got uh, Susan here. I shared some folders with okay. some handouts and some data points that I'd like to yeah. just pass out now so you can have it. Pass them out. <coughs> and with me this evening is um, several members of our team, Assistant Principal Lisa Lennox, who's also <coughs> Principal Designee, and Philip Mack front desk supervisor. Every year around January, each school principal is tasked with an opportunity to really share and extend into the community all the good things that are happening on campus. I do believe I visited you all prior to COVID, so it's great to see you back here, um, back in doing our processes and our procedures as normal. Couple of things, um, I put this packet together and this will be shared out with all of our stakeholders after our meeting tonight. It will be shared with staff, parents, students, and district staff. So you are the first ones to see all the good things that we have going on on campus. 
In your folder, you'll see a couple of items. You'll see a state of the school report that we'll review shortly with some talking points. You'll also see a progress monitoring summary, which I'm happy to share with you a little bit of that. Also on our PowerPoint presentation, if it works, the, the entire audience here tonight will be able to see some student achievement data and some graphs as it pertains to our goals as outlined by the state of Florida. Also in the packet, we'll see our school report card, and this is the 10 categorical cells that each school is graded upon by the state of Florida school accountability system. So you'll be able to see some of our growths in some of the areas of focus as we move into testing season. I've also prepared a graph that outlines the state of our athletic teams and rosters over a three year period, which also identifies areas of growth and focus for us in certain sports. And it also gives us opportunity to highlight some of our sporting teams that have really aggressively worked hard to build their roster. And the last content piece of information in there is a QR code which you can scan to see our current course offerings for the 2022-23 school year. So there's a lot of good data in here. So if we could, um, this is not working, is it? Oh, I apologize, we, we did not get the PowerPoint. Oh, you didn't? No, no. Pull it up. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry for that technical difficulty. All right. So let's take a look at the state of the school packet. Just want to share that our enrollment is sturdy and strong considering post-COVID. We have 1,182 students currently sitting with 100 staff members, 67 teachers, 32 support staff personnel, two SROs, and one campus activities monitor. Our graduation rate actually hit a school record. We're at 98% and counting. So we were able to celebrate that even through a pandemic, Tarpon High continued focus on, on our goals, and we brought in 98%. We also are in the middle of a PCS Connects initiative. Proud to share with you that 86% of our ninth and 10th graders right now have a personal computer device that has been issued to them for schoolwork, also for any enrichment activity, after school practice, tutoring, and in the future, if they elect to, they can use it for state testing. Next year, we will be extending this practice to 11th and 12th grade students. So by this time next year, it is our goal to have over 80% of Tarpon High students with a one-to-one -one computer laptop that is checked out to them for school use. So this is very good. I wanna talk a little bit about curriculum. Our curriculum is standards-based, standards aligned and supported by the Pinellas County Schools Teaching and Learning Department. We have ACE, which is also Cambridge, and advanced placement classes. We also have articulation for dual enrollment, St. Petersburg College, Pinellas Technical College, USF, and UF articulation agreements. We have five magnet programs, and these magnet programs have applied for a national recognition for Merit School Award from Magnet Schools of America, and we're actually awaiting that, that announcement any day. We have a wonderful ACE program, a wonderful leadership conservatory instrumental, our band program, top, top notch, leadership vocal, our choral department, culinary arts, and veterinary science. We're very proud of these academies, and we're also very proud that these academies are home to almost 80% of Tarpon High students. I wanna share with you all, too, our mission. Our mission collectively as a group is to prepare every student with the skill sets necessary to be successful in life. And so many of our decisions as a campus, as a staff, as administrators, um, as collaborative efforts with parents follows on that premise. The decisions we make, the experiences that we have, the enrichment that we bring is all to prepare our students to go out and be 
successful citizens. I want to talk a little bit about athletics and extracurricular. We have 15 athletic teams. The only athletic team that we do not have right now is lacrosse. That is something that there has been discussion on, and that is something that would need to be taken to a vote. And in order to sustain lacrosse on campus, we would have to have representation, both boys and girls, in order to meet Title IX. So that is on our, um, on our dashboard to look at and to bring as an experience for our students. Eastlake and Palm Harbor University, I do believe, have lacrosse teams, so it is a need in our area and it's just now taking it to the next level to look at is it a need and a want for the Tarpon High community. Our locker rooms and our weight training centers have been upgraded through our refurbishment and um, they're beautiful, state of the art, and many schools that do come and visit us say that they're, they're very envious of our facilities. So we're proud of that. We're also proud that our color guard has a training center as well now. So to add to their nationally recognized competition, they have a state-of-the-art training facility. We have many academic clubs, and we also have community-based clubs, and we're very proud of them. Many leadership clubs as well, Art Club, Key Club, Interact Club, National Honor Society, National Spanish Honor Society, and National Art Honor Society, just to name a few. We have a recent sponsorship with Advent Health, as well as the Pinellas Ed Foundation, the Ryan Wells Foundation, which keeps our culinary program in full support of anything our students need in their culinary career pathways. We have a Little Spongers Preschool. I just want to share out that it is a working preschool, and the cost and the rate per family is $60 a week, Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 1.30 p.m. Many people that I speak to in the community talk about teachers and what we endured during COVID and during the pandemic and teaching through the pandemic. And I want to share with you that our efforts on campus for promoting culture and promoting the social emotional learning and support and self care for staff has been our focus. And we will continue second semester to host self care activities for each month. January, we have several activities listed on a calendar and we're going to continue that momentum because the, the impact of COVID and the impact of simultaneous teaching is catching up to many of us. We look back and we think, how did we persevere through all of what we did and we still managed to meet majority of our goals? So that is something that we're working on as a staff to rebuild our culture, to take care of ourselves, and to be there for one another. We do have school-wide expectations for success for all students. So campus-wide, we have what we call the tier one interventions and expectations. And these are keys to success. So students know that they are to be expected to be in class, ready for learning at the bell. They are expected to seek a pass if they need to leave to go out, out and about on campus for, for safety and security. And we are looking to maximize instructional time in the classroom. We're very proud and honored to celebrate the next year. Our band will be revisiting Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in November. Um, this is the second time we have been invited. And I think it's the second time any school in the Tampa Bay area has been invited to return. So it is something that we do need to cherish as a community. Um, to see our students perform. I had the privilege of traveling with them to Tennessee for their, their competition, and I was amazed at the operation that it entails, loading the semis three days before, driving the semis up, unloading, staging in the parking lot of, an, of a stadium field, and getting ready for the, the event. The families and the parents and, and what they do for our students is, is something that I don't think I can ever thank them enough for working together for our kids and giving them the first class experience. Our teachers, um, all of them, like I said, have worked together closely and I do invite each and every one of you to come to campus and tour when we're there and meet and greet the staff. They'd love to see you. I shared in my email to them that many of you on this board, if not 
all of you tonight are graduates and alumni yourselves. And so I think that's very special and something that our staff really would like to see you and, and share off with what they're doing each and every day. Lastly, before we go to our, um, our progress monitoring, I wanna share about safety. I know this has been a hot topic for many schools and we continue to see in the news that schools in our nation are faced with unsafe scenarios at times. Um, Tarpon High and Pinellas County Schools have worked together, Tarpon High, we honor the, the expectations for safety on our campus. Just wanna share with everyone and reassure you, we are very well trained in uh, monthly safety drills and we have a follow-up site safety committee that meets monthly on areas of our campus that to the best of our ability, we can control safe and unsafe scenarios. <coughs> we have all been outfitted with a new app and it's called Safer Watch and it is something that each teacher has um, access to calling 911 through their phone by hitting, a, by hitting a button through an app. And it only is activated on campus through the, like, the, geo the geo circumference of campus. So that is something that we have added in December. Tarpon PD support, um, I can't say enough about the support given to us by our local law enforcement. They're wonderful. Um, they come in, anything we need, they're there. If we ever need any questions asked, if we ever need anything looked into, they're there and they don't ask twice about why. And so I wanna thank Chief Young for all his support and leadership. And so now I wanna share with you some data. So I don't know if you had a chance to look at our athletics, um, but if you can see that we, we have a three-year trend on our athletic graphs and it, it shows us some wonderful things to celebrate, right? It shows us that boys basketball grew over time, the roster. Football continued to grow over time. Flag football, girls soccer, track, swimming, tennis, and wrestling. We do have areas that we do need to work on and through the help and support of our athletic director and athletic coordinator, we will be looking at recruiting our students, our current students on campus, to find a sport for which they can engage that shows interest to them and lets them feel connected to our school. The other two graphs show our student achievement in school grade over a three year. And you will see from the line plot graph that math continues to be an area of focus for us. And that is something that we are putting a lot of effort to right now with one of our um, administrators who was a former math teacher and has now taken the lead in initiatives to help reinforce math skills for our students. Are there any questions so far? Um, Ms. Fellers, uh, Feller is. Yes. I want to thank you for the presentation and for the annual mid-year state uh, of the school, uh, of Tarpon High School. As you know, we all Tarpon Springs High School graduates, and we love Tarpon High. Uh, we're very proud of uh, the school and the, uh, the programs that it's offering, and I'm not going to go and name right. them because I know I'm going to miss half of them, but uh, we are very proud of everything that the school is doing, and we're looking forward to see the band performing to the Macy's Parade next year, or actually this year. Yes. This year, because it will be in November, so we're looking forward to see that again. We are very, very proud. Uh, also, I'm very pleased that we have a very good uh, relationship, uh, partnership with the, uh, the city of Tarpa Springs mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the school. Uh, the uh, SRO program is an excellent program. We provide in two uh, offices. They're there all day long. Mm -hmm. providing service and safety to the, uh, to the school, to the uh, students, and to the, uh, to the teachers. So we are very, very proud. And thank you for all the work that you mm -hmm. do. And please thank the, uh, all the teachers and all the staff that you have working for the school. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Fadelius, thank you for your leadership uh, in Tarpon Springs at the high school. Uh, class of 2004, go Spongers. That's it. <laughs> um, it's proud to, to call Spongers uh, on my alumni and um, being in Tarpon Springs. I love driving by the school and seeing 
all the improvements that have happened over the past couple of years. There's a significant amount of improvements and I appreciate, I think it's all under your leadership that a lot of these have gotten done. So thank you, um, thank you for looking out for the best interests of our residents and the students that go to the school. Um, you have a lot of proud alumni that look to have Tarpon Springs as one of the best schools in the county. Uh, the 98% graduation rate is in uh, something to be celebrated, I believe. Yeah. And I want to say thank congratulations you. to that. Thank you. Um, thank you for the update. Looking forward to visiting the school. I know with COVID, I wanted to stay away, um, but now I'm looking forward to come back and visiting soon. Are you doing any fundraisers currently uh, at the school that we want to let the community know about? Well, right now we have, we're launching the March to Macy's. Um, but I don't have any flyers with me right now um, for that. And I know athletics will be sending out their spring fundraiser as they're starting to budget their needs for the year. So as soon as I get that information, I will forward it over so we can start communicating and marketing that. Um, very proud and I appreciate all the kind words and I have to say it is my pleasure to serve. It's a wonderful school and it's a wonderful community. We have something special. And as one of the last remaining community schools, right, with true feeders, it is something that we need to embrace and celebrate as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Fatalitas. This is a great presentation with a lot of great stats that I wasn't even aware of. Um, I'm really encouraged by a lot of the sport roster statistics going up. Um, mm -hmm. That's awesome news, the graduation rate, the individual teacher accolades. Yes. Um, glad to see everything's going well, and thank you very much for the presentation. Go Spongers. Thank you. Go Spongers. Commissioner Tikiotis. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Fatalitas, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. I, every time I step foot on uh, at Tarpon High, mm -hmm. it, it's new to me. <laughs> it, it's a little different than 1966 when I graduated. <laughs> and uh, I still have my class ring, by the way, that I pull out every now and then or run across. And um, I, I don't pretend to know much about your job. All I know is you do a very good job. Thank and you. so I'm very appreciative of that from the standpoint of the city and the city government. Um, I think what we can all convey to you is if there is every, anything that you need, you're, we're here to help you in any regard. And I'm just very appreciative that you reciprocate as well with things that we may need and, and uh, with regard to the stadium and other things that we need from time to time. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Have a wonderful evening, and I hope to see you all on campus soon for a tour. Thanks. We are now going to the public comments. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. We're going to public comments on the presentation. Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. <clears throat> How we've grown, and she, the Ms. Felitas is right. We are the only community left, and have been the only community in Pine Isles County, to be a homegrown community elementary, middle school, and high school. When you look and remember the names of all the principals and the teachers from Tarpon Springs who came back home to serve their community and the number of graduates, my gosh, when I graduated, the benches were from Townsend Terrapanti's chair to Jacob's chair, three uh, benches high. That was in 1960-61. How schools have changed, how children have changed, students have changed, and we're very, very lucky with the history that we have in this community. I remember when Mrs. Fadlitas was born, <laughs> you know? So you think about how much we have here, and we should be very protective of it and cherish what we've got in Tarpon Springs and historic, because we are. I also want to thank and let you know how outstanding our police department was yesterday and our fire department with what we had on Riverside Drive. The professionalism was unbelievable and the caring that these Mayor, men Mayor, can did. we kind of stick yes. on, the, uh, on the presentation? Oh, after that, we, after that, that we we're going to have a public things. comment. I'm very sorry. So I won't come back up, but they were outstanding and they need to be congratulated. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Theater de Lacs, 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, Anita's right about the history of Tarpon and how we look at educating our kids. I mean, we're in the high school. I went to middle school here. We played basketball on the stage. So I'd like to focus on a couple things that Ms. Fadalidis mentioned. Other sports to consider. Hockey, 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 hockey. Eastlake has a team. In fact, I think they were tied up first or second in the hockey league division, and I'm sure there's a lot of young Bolt fans out there that like to hook, hitch up on that. But here's a thing that I know you mentioned about some of the groups that were increasing. Swimming, swimming. My daughters were on the swim team and I have spoken to a couple of parents who have kids who have kids on the swim team. And what is it they need? And what is it they've been begging for? And we in the city have been begging for for years, a pool. What happened to the pool? Pool, pool, pool. And I'm gonna bring up some history. Paul's right here. What, 209 when we spent about $500,000 and did a whole study on the landfill about putting the whole sports complex? I gave a CD to Commissioner Donovan. He has it. I'd like it back before you leave office. Sports complex, all kinds of fields. So the high school can sponsor tournaments, bringing in people to the city. Economic development by supporting your local schools. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mike Eisner, 1515 Riverside Drive. I personally want to thank Ms. Fatalitas for her help. My wife and I both mentor in the school, and as of Saturday, we have our Rotary Club is doing a, um, a uh, human trafficking awareness event from three to five, and want to thank her for all the help and participation and anybody that wants to come, more than happy to come. And I do thank her for the presentation. I love going to the school. I love being involved with the Interact Club as well. And I just want to thank her for all of that she does, because it's a thankless job sometimes. Thank you. Do we have any other comments on this item? I hear none. Ms. Fillers, thank you. And uh, I'd like everyone to know that uh, you are second generation principal at Tarpon High. Mr. Mutatis was also assistant principal at Tarpon High School with your dad. Thank you for your service. We're now going to the public comments on the items that will not be discussed this evening. If anyone has any comments, please come forward, state your name and your address for the record. You'll be given four minutes. <coughs> Again, Anita Prose, I'm sorry for the mistake I made. I thought it was going to be together. Uh, I'd just like to say we do have another historic building on this property, and that's Henry Kelly's Band Shelter. As, as none of y'all know, the white building in the back, that was Mr. Kelly's band, we call it the band shelter, his band room. And we have preserved it for historic purposes. It has a lot of history and a lot of stories. So not only is this building historic, so is the white band building. And I hope that in the future we will take more care of it because it is that people came and spoke out for the city to take it and preserve it. And that's very important. And I was very happy to hear at the uh, League of Women's uh, uh, Forum that all the candidates are for are in favor of a, uh, an office in here in this building for uh, looking for uh, money from Tallahassee. If you go on the computer, you'll see everything that they're going to fund or ask or have for funding for communities. And as soon as we can get someone here that knows Tallahassee and knows how to get all this funding, we'll be better off. And if you do decide to hire someone, please talk to Dr. Kathy Monahan. She still has 
a lot of connections in Tallahassee. She can tell you who's good down here to hire, and we do need a grant writer full time. We are missing out in Tarpon Springs, big time. Do we have any other public comments? May not be the last one. Mike Eisen, 1515 Riverside Drive. This is just a little story. Um, I went to the Shell Station on Tarpon Avenue in 19 today around 3 o'clock, and I pulled out onto 19. I needed to go over to the um, foot doctor, and I just wanted to share the story that with my driving skills, I could not make it from the right lane over to the make that turn all the way that distance. I had to go all the way to Beckett. Um, it was like being in a slot car race. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, and this was around 3 o'clock. So just wish to share the story. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? Good evening. Peter Lacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. As I kind of showed you, I'm sure you saw it last week. This was the uh, Suncoast News about a wonderful play going on at the old cultural center, which used to be the city hall. So, happened to see it on Friday, and it was amazing, amazing, amazing portrayal. Father James Ruskos was playing the conquistador and the priest. The girl who threw out the dove played the Indian princess. Her mother played the Indian queen. I would highly recommend all of you see this because it's titled, This Blessed Plot, This Earth. Now for our reading tonight. Hosea 4. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring in. Against you who live in the land where there is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There's only cursing, lying, and murder, and stealing, and adultery. They break all the bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land mourns, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea are dying. Now, if you haven't had a chance to go look at this mural, do so. And you will see it portrays the history from Indians to conquistadors to the crackers to the spongers, which was the most current. What's going to be the next picture on there? What is the future legacy of Tarpon? Will it be apartments on this river? Or will it be something else to save that land? It's in your hands, and it will be coming back to you. So think about what your legacy is, and what your duty to God in protecting the land is. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? I hear none. We are now going to the uh, consent agenda. Number one is the attorney fees, Johnson & Johnson, invoice 8866. Number two is a special event. A, Fine Arts Festival. B, Movies in the Park. C, Greek Independence Day Parade. C, is a Sunset Beach Concert Series. Number three is the increase file, number 210215. C, AM, Utilize St. Judge County 
Florida bit 2105 countywide pipe manhole lining renewal and rehabilitation services, master contract 21 M CCGRA 13190. And number four is the award file number 220077 NJL single source purchase of Caterpillar original equipment manufacturer parts and services. And number five is the increase file number 170167, BCM, Asphalt Materials. Number six is the award file number 220078, CAS, Microsoft License Maintenance and Services through uh, Sourcewell Cooperative Contract Number 081419SHI. Any of the items that you'd like to pull? Number five for me, please. Number five. Pull 2A. 2A. Any other? Okay, we're going to public comments of the items 1, 2A, C, D, 3, 4, and 6. Do we have any comments on these items? Any public comments on these items? Here none. Need a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiel? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahoukas? <coughs> yes. Uh, number two, which is special events. B, movies in the park. Vice Mayor Carr? It's actually a 2A, Mayor. 2A? Yeah. 2A? Yeah. Okay. I had a question. I saw the president of the chambers here, and I wasn't sure if I could ask her a couple questions about the event. Jean Hungerville, um, I'm president and CEO of the Tarpon Springs Chamber. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Hey, Jean, thanks for being here tonight. It's good to see you. Um, I'm sure you're excited to have this back on the calendar after a couple years hiatus, I would imagine. Absolutely. Um, I just want to first just highlight this a little bit more than accept, except it just being <coughs> the, the consent agenda, just so people are realizing we're having it this year. It's going out there. Um, it's moving forward. Um, Appreciate what you've done for this. I know there's a lot of work behind this uh, each year. It's a big fundraiser event for you as a chamber to uh, keep the chamber as successful in Tarpon Springs. Uh, I do see the fee is five dollars this year. Is is that include any drinks or anything? Or is it just straight five dollar fee to get in? It's the straight five dollar fee that it has been for the last five years. Okay. It's been probably about eight years since they included um, water, but that was back when water was only about twenty five cents a bottle. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, parking, uh, there's going to be parking signs out by 19 directing people where to park, or how do we direct our visitors that come into town where to park? We have on our, we now have a website for the Tarpon Springs um, Fine Arts Festival .com. Um, It has on there that there is free parking at Tarpon Tower. We will be running three shuttles um, from, nine until, from 9 until 5 or quarter to 5 both days during the event. Um, that will help alleviate public parking that is supposed to be downtown or down in that area. Um, shuttles will run continually. Um, we've been doing that for quite some time and done so successfully. Great, great. Um, any issues with getting um, vendors to participate this year or you're looking at a full house? We're looking at almost a full house. We have room for 210. We had um, close to 400 <coughs> apply. There were quite a number of artists that rolled over from the previous two years, so we had about 50% that rolled over, continued to have their space and, and held for them. Um, of the new ones, we lost probably, I would say, two dozen um, artists that either um, passed away or um, closed up shop over the last couple of years, um, a couple of which, which were quite talented, which we were very disappointed to lose. Um, we also had some, some new ones that um, this is the first time that they had um, tried out for a show. Um, some of the good feedback that we've gotten from some of the jurors um, will help them improve their product so that maybe next year they'll be able to make it. We have 185 um, this year that are, um, several came off of the wait list, but those, that's what we have. It's not a full capacity park, but it's probably going to be um, enough space that people won't feel absolutely cramped and crowded like we do with 100 and, or 210. Great, okay, that's good news. Um, and then 
I know each year it's a little bit different on the, the dates. How do we land on the dates? Like this is in the middle of March, right? It's like the busiest time of the year kind of for the area. Is it you typically run from March to May? I can't remember, May, March, April. How do you land on those dates? Is it like a, um, a rotating kind of where the artists kind of bounce around different parts of the country, or how do you come up with that? The artists are on a circuit. When I came on board, we usually looked at when were the two different um, Easter's, when was the Independence Day parade, and we would adjust to that as well as when the snowbirds were still here. Um, my first festival in 2017, we left that festival not knowing exactly when the next year was going to be because um, Independence Day fell in the middle of the week and we didn't know when New York was going to have their parade versus us. All of that was factored into it. We sat down for the next three months, called other, um, called some of the artists that are on the circuit. We called other venues that had some major shows, one of which happened to be Winter Haven, and we moved the event to the second weekend in March. We checked for the next seven years, and we will always be ahead one week before Winter Haven. What that has done is it doesn't conflict with any of the other major events in the area um, as far as, as festivals, and it allows us to draw a higher caliber of artists that are coming for Winter Park, which is an extremely large um, event. And we now are being able to draw some higher quality artists that come from Colorado, California, Arizona, um, Seattle, that will then come to us first and then move on towards Winter Park. Winter Park was very supportive of us doing that and turned over some of their list to us to be able to solicit them. Great. So it's going to be the, the same week then for the past few years and moving forward then, right? We're looking to have it the second weekend in March for as long as we can do that. It, it provides consistency for the artists so that they can absolutely put it on their calendar. Uh, we're getting great feedback, and this is something we started um, the second year that I was here, and it's been successful so far. Great. All right. Thank you for uh, sharing some more information on the Fine Arts Festival and looking forward to uh, this year and participating on it. So. One of the other things I'd like to add is we have had a tremendous outpouring of um, volunteer support. Um, Sign Up Genius, which is what we use for the almost 500 spaces, that's more than half full and we're still six weeks out. We have had quite a number of people here sitting at the dais that have um, signed up to work, um, sometimes double shifts, which is terrific. A lot of people in the community in particular um, are excited about it. It's a, it's a fun event. Absolutely. So yeah. I just wanted to thank everybody for that. Great. Thank you. I've got no further questions, Mayor. Thank you. Commission of Articulators, item five, the increased bid number 720167, the asphalt materials. Right. Uh, I just wanted to understand, um, and I'm not sure I don't see uh, Mr. Funch in here, but the, the reason we're going up from 20,000 to 80,000 um, in the annual, that's. I'll let Janina start to answer that. Ms. Lewis? Yes, so in the past two years, um, the number of projects kind of with the COVID were on delay. So we couldn't really, you know, the teams were not at, you know, the workspace to get out there and do these projects. <clears throat> so now that we've picked back up and our pace is increasing, we've had to increase the amount of the contract and that's really what's causing this increase. And also, we added additional funding to be able to complete through the rest of the year of the contract. Okay. So that's good news. Yes, okay. yes, we're getting projects done is what you're looking that's at. That's great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna to go to uh, public comments on uh, 2A and item number five. Do we have any public comments on those two items? Here none, the chair will retain the motion. Motion approved. Second. The roll call, please. Commissioner Vedicutis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lizis? Yes, thank you. We are now going to the uh, special consent agenda. Item number seven is the uh, is to select uh, Cardon Incorporated and DRMP Incorporated for the uh, RFQ 220014 SJL Engineer on Record Service Staff Report. Mr. Robinson. Good evening, Mayor Commissioners. I'm Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. For this item, we're requesting board authorization to award two engineer of record contracts. The previous five-year terms expired in December, and working with procurement, we issued an RFQ last October, and now this is the result of that process. 
the evaluation committee evalu evaluated eight responses that we received to the uh, RFQ, the request for qualifications. We shortlisted four from that point, and then we're going to select, um, as we selected the, the two top ranked firms, as you said, Mayor Cardno Incorporated and DRMP Incorporated. We are asking the board's approval for an annual aggregate spending limit of $850,000. That's a combined limit for both firms. You may recall in previous years, we requested setting this limit at $700,000. Um, we're, we're going higher this time primarily to account for uh, additional design work that we're anticipating coming through the ARPA um, funding, Ar ARPA project funding. So with that, Mr. Mayor, back to you. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? I hear none. Now the chair will retain the motion. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Mr. Robbins, I have a question to ask you. I know that you have a very good working relationship with uh, Cardinal, but tell us about uh, the uh, DRMP. Do you have any working experience with them, and how do they do? We know some of the members, and uh, we'll check references after um, we did check references. Um, we, they also had a strong proposal and uh, interviewed well. They had all the disciplines that we're looking for, um, highlighting some of the newer ones. We're focusing in on sustainability as a new um, effort and a, a project focus area that we wanted our, the new firms to be able to uh, demonstrate expertise in. Um, so we feel like they're very qualified and very experienced in, in doing similar types of continuing services or engineer record type contracts for similar sized cities. So the uh DRMP will be like a you standby company or you, you, you divide the work 50-50? How does that work? Yeah, I tend to uh, divide the work equally. Um, it, sometimes some, some of the firms have better expertise than others. It seems like both of these, uh, Cardno and DRMP, are pretty well qualified across the board. So uh, that's typically how I'll do it. Thank you. Commission Donovan? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Robertson, for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to know, I know you mentioned the evaluation committee, but can you touch on some of the criteria that's used when you're selecting these companies? Sure. Um, we evaluate them based on their, um, the members of their team and their experience. Um, we evaluate their approach to how they work with engineer record contracts. We also evaluate uh, and score them based on their experience with similar types of projects, as well as their um, budget and schedule controls systems that they use to keep an eye on the project budget to make sure that they're doing the work as, as it's scoped. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Vatikuris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Robertson, I may have asked this before in the past. Um, I know we're replacing uh, American Consulting Engineers with uh, the RMP, and I know they've been tasked with certain things that, <coughs> excuse me, go um, beyond the year and into when we've got DM. How does that work? Do we do we continue paying American Consulting Engineers? Yeah, all those uh, task work orders. We have six active ones that will remain active and, until they're completed. Uh, those were executed under the terms of the existing contract, and those stay active, so we continue and, to work with them. And the same applies, for example, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken on the name, Tetra Tech, uh, the um, environmental engineering firm oh, that yes. helped us. I think they were under American Consulting Engineers, and I think recently they may have been subcontracted by Cardno as well, if I remember right. No, that um, remained under American, and that is still one of those six active ones. It would be the same... Um, arrangement with them, even the subcontractor, that we would keep them on until they complete the current tasking, and then um, any new <coughs> tasking, such as in the environmental uh, consulting uh, or area would be either re-presented to Cardno or DMRP. Is that the way it would work? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. On the roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lohises? Okay, thank you. At 7.30, we're going to start the public hearing, which is item number 10. We're going to take a break, and we'll come back at seven before 7.30 to start that.
We are now reconvening the BOC meeting at 7.30 p.m. Item number 10 is the uh, resolution 2022-01, budget resolution for fiscal year 2022. City Attorney, if you please read the resolution. Mayor Commissioners, Resolution 2022-01, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for fiscal year 2021-22. That was the reading of Resolution 2022-01 by title only. Staff report. Uh, good Mr. evening, Mayor. I'm sorry. I said Mr. Herrick. Oh. Okay. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Budget Resolution 2022-01 is to bring forward budgeted items from fiscal year two, to fiscal year 2022 from fiscal year 2021 that were still in process and not completed as of September 30th, 2021. The items to bring forward were approved and budgeted in fiscal year 2021. Uh, on the cover letter, I've listed the major projects individually that are over 100,000. The more, majority of these projects are ongoing in the construction phase or in the engine, engineering design phase. And after that are some smaller capital operating items. And then after that are some donation balances that are bringing forward from uh, September 30th, 2021. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. We're gonna to go to uh, public comments on this item. Do we have any public comments on this item? If you, if you do, please come forward. Hear none, the chair will entertain the motion. I move. Second. Any commission comments? Vice Mayor O'Connor. Yeah, Mark, I had a quick question about the tree survey for 138,000. I just don't recall that being something that we talked about in detail for 138,000. Um, can you send me some more detail on that um, this week? Please, sure. In the board? I just would rather see trees planted instead of a survey completed um, with the funds. So, sure. Thanks. Any other commission comments? Here none. I, uh, I'm happy to uh, report that we received a notification from the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada that the City of Tarpa Springs has awarded the uh, Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of government accounting and financial reporting. And I'd like to congratulate and to thank our Director, Finance Director, Mr. Herrick, and your staff. Congratulations. Well, thank you. We take great pride in that, and the staff works really hard in trying to get that award every year. Yeah. So this is the third year that we're getting that? Oh, no, no, no. We're up to 27 now. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we are good. Thank you so much. Um, and roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yeah. <coughs> yes. <coughs> Thank you. Next is item number 11 is the ordinance 2021-26, the application 21-134, preliminary planned development for North Lake Trails, 1215 Cypress Street. This is the second reading, and this is a quasi-judicial. The city will, the city attorney will read the, the title, and he will explain the, uh, judicial process. Thank you, Mayor. This is Ordinance 2021-26, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning map of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida for 4.47 acres, more or less, of real property located at the southeast corner of Mellon Street and North Jasmine Avenue from zoning designation R100, single-family residential, to zoning designation RPD, residential plan development, approving the preliminary plan development for North Lake Trail residential plan development, application number 21-134, providing for waivers of design requirements of the land development code, providing for findings and providing for an effective date. That was the second final reading of ordinance 2021-26 by title only. The legal advertising included being published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map it was advertised on November 24, 2021 and January 12, 2022. This is a quasi-judicial hearing where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. 
In a quasi-judicial hearing, the board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the code of ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the code of ordinances, then the board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the code of ordinances, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. This being the second hearing, the quasi hearing having been held at the first public hearing, this would only be for any additional information that is, needs to be presented to the commission since the, uh, the occurrence of the last public hearing. And we'll go ahead and start with Ms. Vincent. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and have everybody stand up and that's gonna testify uh, to be sworn under oath. And I'll ask about <coughs> ex parte communications and conflicts in just a moment. I swear the testimony you're about to give is gonna be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, thank you. Any ex parte communications or conflicts of interest that want to be, need to be disclosed? Yes, Commissioner Vaticotis. Thank you, Mr. Trask. Um, I did speak to uh, Mr. Stamis, uh, touch base with him after the last hearing concerning the sidewalk out front. Um, he described to me what he, how he was gonna plan on proceeding and, and then described the fallback position um, for the final development plan if that didn't work. And, and um, what he described to me is manifested on the plans as they're shown this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Vice Mayor? I just had the, the same from the last meeting, so nothing more than what I already disclosed. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Renee? Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, Renee Vincent, Planning and Zoning Director. Again, this is the second reading of application 21 134. So, for the purposes of this evening, um, I would enter into the record the previous uh, presentation and materials. And then tonight we'll discuss uh, changes since the first reading. Um, so uh, this is the site um, at the uh, intersection south and east of the intersection of Jasmine and Mellon. It's a five-acre parcel. Um, this is a plan development, preliminary plan development request for um, an 18-unit uh, single-family subdivision. Um, there's a... a Alternate lot, alternative lot dimensions being requested uh, and waivers associated with that. And at the last hearing, there was also the discussion of a waiver for a sidewalk um, along Mellon Street. Uh, since that, uh, after the discussions at first reading, the developer has revisited that and preliminarily thinks that they can now provide a sidewalk, um, uh, you know, basically right, right, you know, adjacent to the property line. Um, on the back side of that, that this you know, stormwater facility. Um, so the, what the developer is proposing is that um, they will provide that sidewalk if the city deems it to be feasible and we would evaluate that during the final plan development process. We would need to get with our enge stormwater engineers um, and, and evaluate if that is going to you know, materially alter you know, what's happening with this facility and, 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 it, and is, it, is, it, is it feasible. Mm -hmm. If we determine, the, we the city, that it is not, then the alternative would be, um, as previously discussed, uh, the uh, developer would put a sidewalk in the 20-foot easement area um, of the Cypress Street area, uh, road that's you know, proposed to be vacated um, out to North Jasmine. So associated with that, then depending on which arrangement um, as we go through final plan development takes place, um, if the sidewalk is uh, feasible and, uh, and for Mellon Street and can be, uh, can be constructed, then the crosswalk to the Pinellas Trail would occur at this intersection. Um, if we find that the sidewalk is not feasible, then we would, uh, the sidewalk uh, would be put here, and then the inter the crosswalk to the Pinellas Trail would be provided at the intersection entrance with the sub into the subdivision. So that's what's being proposed. That's those the those are the changes um, to the plan um, that has also necessitated a change to the conditions um, of approval. So I'm just going to skip to those, and then we can go back and discuss. Um, so conditions number two. Um, 
three and six are new or, or amended since first reading, so I'll focus on those. So condition two is a sidewalk will be provided along the Mellon Street frontage subject to approval slash feasibility by the city of Tarpon Springs. If a sidewalk along Mellon Street is deemed infeasible by the city of Tarpon Springs, a sidewalk will be provided within the 20 foot easement of the vacated Cypress Street right of way to provide a, to provide a pedestrian access from the, from the subdivision out to Jasmine Avenue. Feasibility of the sidewalk along Mellon Street shall be determined during the final development process. Then condition number three really um, is predicated on what happens in condition number two. So based upon the future sidewalk location identified in condition two above, a crosswalk to the Pinellas Trail will either be provided at the intersection of Mellon Street and Jasmine Avenue if, Mellon, if the Mellon Street sidewalk is provided or at the subdivision entrance if the sidewalk is provided in the Cypress Street easement area. And then the other change um, can do what is now condition number six is, um, no, I don't, I'm gonna, this is a separate requirement for an additional easement in addition to what's being provided in the next uh, second reading with the vacation, uh, the 20 foot easement. And I'm gonna go back to the plan so you can see this before I read it into the record. So on the site plan, and it's difficult to see on here, but the, this outline here is the, jazz, is the Cypress Street right of way that's to be vacated. And you'll notice that there's a gap over to the sports complex. So a piece of that is owned by, uh, by Pioneer Developers. The other piece of it, it splits in the middle, is owned by Rose, is part of Rose Hill Cemetery property. So we have asked um, both to provide basically an extension of that 20 foot easement out to the, the sports complex so that we can continue to use, one, we, our utilities are there, and we've also historically used that for access to the sports complex. So uh, what that breaks down then is a five feet of that would be on the Pioneer property, and then 15 feet of it would be from Rose Hill. Um, I have discussed that with the representative from Rose Hill Cemetery. They do, um, they are agreeable to that, at least as it's been discussed now. Um, and so is uh, the developer. So let me go, now I'll go back to the, and just read that last condition into the record now that I've shown it to you. A separate easement for utility maintenance and access will be required across the adjacent private property separating the Cypress Street right of way from the Tarpon Springs Sports Complex, an extension of the 20 foot easement to be provided in conjunction with the Cypress Street vacation. If such easements are not provided, the city shall be granted an access via the developer's internal street that dead ends into the city of Tarpon Springs Sports Complex for the purpose of park maintenance only. The access shall not be utilized by the general public. Design of that and maintenance shall be determined with the final plan development application. So, um, sorry to read those verbatim into the record, but they were changes, so I did want, wanted to get those um, in. Um, so with that, I'll stop there, and uh, our recommendation is to approve with these changes um, as presented, and I'll be happy to answer any questions um, at the appropriate time. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Trask, and thank you, Ms. Benson. Um, this is kind of unique. I, I really appreciate the, the flexible conditions, I guess, um, when it comes to making this work as, as best it possibly can with the pedestrian access. I had a question regarding the road access. So what's the scenario in number six where that we lose that road access? So that's, so then what we would, uh, as a condition of approval, we would require, and this would be um, discussed and memorialized during the final plan development. This, the, the developer would provide, a, you know, a, an access at this dead end point here internally um, so that we can gain access just for purposes of maintenance and things like that. It would not be a, an access for the general public, but that way, you know, we would have, you know, access into the park without crossing this private property. Okay, but ideally like that. that road stays. Correct. Okay. Assuming that road stays, is that something where later on we would be able to work something out with some of the nonprofits that use the fields to say maybe on the weekends? Um, you know, if you need that for an access point, you can use it. Is that something that we would be allowed to do? Uh, right now, as I got, can we can we revisit that when we get to the the vacation? Uh, that that vacation language, the easements are 
are tied to the vacation and the easement language is there. So if we need to amend that language, that would be the appropriate time to do it. So okay. the, the next application, I think we can more fully address that. Item 12? Yes. Okay. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Commissioner Vaticutis? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Vincent, on the final, we're going to do another TRC. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, that'll tie off any loose ends with yes. the drainage and, and the yes. sidewalk. On the, um, on the, um, th there was, I think in your write up, there was a discussion if we, uh, if the sidewalk goes on along the property line uh, across the front of the um, uh, development, then there's some comment about there may not be a need for a crosswalk at the entrance. Um, that, to, that's to the trail because it would be shifted over to the corner of Jasmine and, and that's the, the developer's intent yes it would be one or the other but not both okay. um, that's not the staff's but I, I, I don't think we really have an opinion on it one way or another frankly well the only thing I would the only thing I would ask is to kind of seize on that opportunity to you know we do have a lot of cut through going through mm -hmm. there speeding we've gotten complaints I would hope that during the TRC um, there would be some discussion of whether a, a stop sign that was mentioned at the last uh, Absolutely. meeting. Maybe uh, even though there's a sidewalk there, there may be some value of going ahead with a crosswalk at that location, stripe it. installing yeah. a, mm -hmm. a stop sign, and then kind of moderating and maybe discouraging the cut through there and, and letting people go through the normally. So that, that was all I had. We'll do that definitely okay. during the TRC review for final. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You have a question? Uh, yes, Ms. Vincent, when do we expect to see the final plan development? Uh, you'll have, I'll have to defer that question to, to, the, to the applicant. I don't know what their schedule is. But you're going they to have be... one year to submit for final plan development. Okay. But you're going to be working with the uh, uh, city engineer to determine if it's feasible to put the sidewalk or not? It, it, once they submit for final plan development, then we'll have that, that facility evaluated uh, for capacity and any alterations that might have to take place to put the sidewalk in. Thank you. Vice Mayor, did you have a question? No? Uh, I just want to say, so, I mean, the applicant is, you stated it, so I want to make sure it's coming back again. I was excited to see that the applicant did put it in the, uh, the render, I'm sorry, the the proposal that there be a five foot sidewalk up against the um, neighborhood. Uh, I do think it's important. I hope it works out that way. Um, from a standpoint, I think there's some other discussion too that came up about uh, Rose Cemetery uh, and potentially any uh, unmarked graves on this piece of property. You brought it up last time. Can you reiterate what requirements are or is there any additional requirements that we would need to look at for that? So the development itself will be required to perform a level one cultural resource assessment. So, which is, you know, it's, it's evaluating the area, but it also includes like a periodic shovel test to a certain depth. And I don't know what the depth is off the top of my head, but it's kind of a grid type of, of, of review, just looking for anything that might be um, of archeological or historical significance before you go into any kind of full to ground disturbing activities. Could there be any additional requirement from like um, X-raying the ground or something like that with USF or is that something that uh, I think that's at the discretion of the board at this point if you want to require that okay all right thank you thank you um, mr. Stamos do you have any cross-examination questions of miss Vincent okay thank you do you have a presentation that you would like to make any any additional comments since the last meeting yeah so I'd like to point out on that last comment <clears throat> that the uh, city has already installed two utility lines through that 15 foot between what we're going to get from the vacation, providing that it's passed, and um, and the Rose Hill property line. They've already they've already dug two, you know, fairly deep ditches all the way through down the full extent of that property line already in the past. And so I think if there was anything there to be discovered, you know, in that manner, you would have found it in that 15 feet, not another 15 feet over from the property line. So it's kind of, uh, in my, my opinion anyway, that that's already kind of been dis explored, we'll call it, when they install the, the two utility lines there. 
but we are going to do the archaeological survey as requested, and if there's anything that shows up, of course, we'll, we'll deal with it. Just my, that's an observation on that. That's it. Okay, before you sit down, sir, yeah. any, any questions? Yes, Mayor, you have a question. <laughs> Mr. Stamos, the, uh, there's two lines that you're talking about. Is that a water line that you've been installed or sewer well, lines? What, what kind of a line are you talking about? The city has a water line there that's right up against Rose Hills property. Um, it's like two feet off of their property line in the east in the right of way. It's a full, you know, water line there. It's been uh, dug in probably at least 30 inches deep or maybe 36 inches deep when they installed it years ago. Um, and um, there's also a force uh, storm line in there to, that's there to drain the cemetery ponds if they ever get to the overflow point that's also dug in there probably 36 inches deep all the way down the whole property line. So it's been, it's been excavated already in the past. Okay. I don't so think we're pretty city, sure that there's nothing there. Well, I that? wouldn't think so. You know, if they've already done that with a backhoe or whatever they used to put it in there with, it's been excavated pretty thoroughly already. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions of Mr. Stamis, <laughs> Vice Mayor? I just, uh, just for clarification, so is this, the lot's going to be cleared, right? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Okay. And then, so how much grade, I know probably site plan will get into this further, um, but I mean, are you moving a lot of dirt around to make it level, <coughs> or is it something that you're bringing a lot of dirt in, or how does that work in this situation? Well, there, I don't think there'll be any dirt imported, but there's a fairly uh, good grade from the uh, south to the north. It falls off to the north to Mellon Street, probably four feet, three and a half, four feet in, in elevation, going from Rose Hill to Mellon Street across the site. Um, so it's gonna have to have some leveling going on, but it'll probably take place with dirt that comes, that's on site. Out of the pond or something? Yeah, the pond, the pond's gonna- So is there a wall you have to build in on the north, on the back of the north property up against the that drainage ditch then? No, we're not planning on it at this stage, but of course it hasn't been totally engineered yet that this <coughs> is from the preliminary plan and looking at the elevations, I don't think we're gonna need a retaining wall. Okay, all right. Um, thanks for bringing the sidewalk back too and putting that in there. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Stamis. Um, anyone from the public like to speak on this agenda item? And if so, if you could stand up uh, to the podium and state your name, make your statement. You will be timed. Peter Lack is 514 Ashland Avenue. Um, as I had showed y'all last time, there is a picture in your backup with all the uh, animal burrows and such of that nature. And as you heard Mr. Stamis say, there's going to be a significant amount of grading. And in the environmental resource permit uh, or environmental resource study, uh, there was a couple of issues. One, it states here, uh, the following listed species were considered either due to the project's location in the USFWS formal consultation area or due to the proximity of known habitat, gopher tortoises, eastern indigo snake, bald eagle, Florida sandhill crane, wading birds, shorebirds, and woodstork. An updated gopher tortoise survey will be required approximately nine days prior to construction and FWC permitting and relocation of any tortoises will be required. Uh, my question to you would be, who will be monitoring this? Uh, also, it does state here, uh, says during the field review, no Florida Sandhill cranes or their nests were observed. There's no preferred nesting habitat within the project. It is anticipated the project will have no effect on the Florida Sandhill crane. Uh, but as I sent y'all last time, uh, there were uh, Sandhill cranes. They uh, hang out at the cemetery, which is just adjacent to that. Now. As we get to the actual ordinance, uh, it surprises me. Condition one, approval of the preliminary plan development shall be contingent on the vacation of Cypress Street. But you won't hear that till afterwards. Why would you not hear the vacation first? And then this would not be a factor. Also, there were changes, as Ms. Renee Vincent mentioned, two, three, six. 
And uh, one of the things that Mr. Kuskudis had said to y'all uh, a while back at a public comments is that they'll see something, approve it or not approve it, and then by the time it gets to y'all, first reading, then second reading, all these changes. And they did not have a chance to discuss the vacation. They were told that that's not their purview, it's the Board of Commissioners, it's not relevant. Yet, it's the first condition. Now, something else I want to also point out. I was talked a lot about sidewalks in the new ordinance about whose provides a sidewalk will be provided along the Mellon Street frontage. Well, who's providing the sidewalk? You're assuming from that it's the developer. Yet, if you go to the ordinance for the vacation, number uh, section findings B, the city of Tarpon Springs wish to retain a municipal easement to construct, remove, reconstruct, operate, maintain, and perpetuity existing utilities to access the Tarpon Springs Sports Complex and, here's the good part, and construct, remove, reconstruct, and maintain in perpetuity the pedestrian sidewalk. That's along the vacated thing if the melon thing doesn't work. So who's paying for the sidewalk? One thing says city is, and the other ordinance assumes that applicant will be paying it. And in regards to uh, Mr. Carr's concern and Mr. Stamis's rebuttal that, well, there was already two ditches dug and they would have found it, but I doubt people digging ditches were looking for artifacts or potential remains. And it's not that much different to get some kind of a ground survey to survey the total property because these were from the late 1800s, early 1900s. We have no idea how far the extent was. So to be sure, require them to do some type of ultrasound or some other type of ground survey study. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this agenda item? Any day of 803 South Distance Avenue. Uh, I would like, along with the board, to see an additional survey done because we were told when USF did the work over there that they did find remains two outside of the fence. So the only way we could be sure is to have additional survey done just to make sure that there is nothing there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? A anyone else from the public want to speak on this agenda item? Okay. Renee, did you want to make any type of summary? No? Okay. Mr. Stamis, any type of summary that you would like to give? No? Okay. C Mayor, it's back to the commission for consideration. Thank you. Uh, the chair will retain a motion on this item. Motion to approve. Second. And we go to uh, commission comments. I'd like to comment that uh, I am pleased that the developer came up with a solution regarding the uh, construction of the sidewalk on the Mellon Street because it's very important. Uh, uh, in effort of the city to become, to be a walking community since 2017, for sidewalk installation and repair, we spent $1.4 million to make sure that we have sidewalks throughout the city. So especially when we have a new development, we've got to make sure whatever we can to, to have sidewalks there, not only for the residents of the, uh, the subdivision of the development, but for the whole area to be used to walk and for recreation purposes. So to me, it's very, very important. Thank you. Vice Mayor, do you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, I've got a comment about the underground survey or radar or sonar or whatever that one may be. I'm assuming we can probably do that on the site plan. 
I'm uh, not positive about that, but I mean, it is something that I would be interested in learning more about and kind of what the cost would be before I put a requirement on the developer for that. Um, so if staff could come back, I would think that would be something we should be able to evaluate um, for the final site plan. Uh, overall, it's, uh, I mean, it looks like a good development. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the, um, the, the type of zoning or the type of aspect that's being used, but it's in the, it's in the, um, it's on our zoning options and they're able to utilize it and they're deep lots. So, and it also fits with the surrounding neighborhood. So at that point, I, I think we've got a uh, reasons to uh, approve this tonight. Commissioner Ticotis, comments? Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I wanted to just add to a couple of things. Um, I, I'm fine with the uh, site plan, but um, Mr. Lack has mentioned the, um, the um, vacation uh, of the right-of-way coming after the development order. And, um, it, it, and I, went, I worked through this the last time that he made this comment, but I think it might be worth um, um, kind of explaining that a little bit. Um, this is an RPD, a residential plan development, and there are certain conditions that have to be satisfied, of which any of the conditions that are not satisfied, the RPD does not go forward. However, on a vacation, um, there is no condition. In other words, it's vacated on condition that the RPD proceeds and gets under construction. So it seems to me that um, you don't want to vacate a right away before you know that the project is going to um, um, to get um, uh, approve the vacation of the right of way before you actually um, approve the RPD. For example, at the first reading, the project could have been denied, and that would have been the end of the story on that one. And I'm not sure what you do with the um, um, uh, with the vacation of the right of way. So it seemed like it was logical to proceed the way we've done. Maybe maybe I'm, I'm missing something, but is there is this traditionally the way it's done, or is there something that we, we typically will run these concurrently? So you know that I think Mr. Lacus was maybe talking about the fact that you know maybe the vacation should have at least been heard first prior to the, the plan development. Um, the and, and I'll, I'll look when we get to the vacation. I'll I, I want to look through the ordinance again. Um, we can make the we can make these kind of contingent one upon the other, I believe, and I'll lean on the city attorney to look at that before we get to that second reading, if that is of concern to the board that unless the final plan development gets approved and moves forward, the vacation doesn't get, you know, so we can, I guess we can hold the recording of the vacation, we can collect the easements and things of that nature, so when we get there, I think that would be, would be the appropriate time to address it, so. That, that, that just some additional sure. detail in that regard, so that, does, that issue doesn't follow with this plan. The other thing too, um, if the Mellon Street, my understanding, I'm, I'm, I'm certain I'm, I'm accurate, I just want to state it, that if the Mellon Street uh, sidewalk doesn't get uh, approved from across the property line, um, the uh, developer is required to pay into our sidewalk fund an amount equivalent to what that would be. So any additional work by the city or whatever along in lieu of that Mellon Street would still provide the access from the, the south side of the development onto Jasmine. That would come out of part of the, although it'd be mixed money, that would still come out of, uh, it would already have been paid for by the money that the developer would have submitted because the Mellon Street um, sidewalk had not been put in. Is that, is that, do you, you follow or am I getting a little? <laughs> well, and, and we're not at the point where I'm supposed to be answering questions, so, because we're beyond the, so I'll have to defer to the attorney if I should even be answering questions at this point. But, well, we're, so. we're, if the Mellon Street on the contingency that the Mellon Street sidewalk doesn't get built, then. We'll pay in lieu. They will pay in lieu. They will pay in lieu, and that money could be used for constructing that one sidewalk from the, end of the south end of road C. So 
to JASMA, which I think is being. We'll, we'll, I'll answer those questions okay. when we get to the next um, agenda item. But it, it, but it's already it's already set forth in the documents that are in your backup, and I can explain it a little bit further when we get to that. But the developer has to do one or the other. The right. city's not going to construct anything. No, I just want yeah. to clarify that in case there was some issue that we're putting the sidewalk in, it should have been the responsibility of the. It will the be the responsibility the, of the developer. Yeah, I'll cover that in the. I'll refer to it in the easement documents when in we get next, to it. In the next yeah. item? Okay. Yeah. Thank well, you. I'll show it to, to you where it's at. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. That's all the questions I have, Mayor. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments? If not, roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Marla Hussis? Yes. Thank you. Next is item number 12. The ordinance 2022 01 the application 21 155 vacation of right away Cypress Street. This is a second reading. City Attorney, please read the ordinance 2022 01. Ordinance number 2022 01, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, vacating and abandoning the right of way of East Cypress Street lying east of North Jasmine Avenue and south of Mellon Street, providing for conditions, providing for findings, reserving a municipal easement providing for recordation and the public records of Pinellas County and providing an effective date. That was the second final reading of ordinance 2022-01 by title only. This was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on December 22nd, 2021. Staff report. Uh, thank you. Um, so I did not amend the, the PowerPoint <coughs> at all on this. However, I do want, but I, I put up the exhibit that shows the, uh, the the easement area <coughs> and explains the, or at least <coughs> attempts to explain. So the red outline is the vacation, the Cypress Street right of way to be vacated. And then the municipal easement is you know, five feet of that is, is on what would be the Pioneer property. 15 feet of that is on what would become uh, uh, property of the adjacent to, with Rose Hill Cemetery. So there's a 20 foot easement. Um, the, since the first reading, um, Attorney Trask did uh, review um, the, the ordinance. And so the, and we clarified in the ordinance that the, the, municipal, the easements have to be, specific easements have to be provided for and granted by the two adjoining property owners, Rose Hill, um, and uh, what I think is, is, is it's, it's GPR, GGR, North Lake Trail. So uh, the, the ordinance that you have um, reflects those two draft municipal easements. The easements themselves were drafted by um, the city attorney. And so I don't know, do you want to, do you wanna go over those? Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll let the city attorney go over those. Um, and then the, um, so the effective date is, uh, at this point, the way it's, it's written is shall become effective upon adoption and recording of executed easements as provided in section two. So then I'll stop there and we can take <laughs> up the discussion of is there additional effective date that you want to be considered or somehow tie this to the final plan development or something else. So um, I'll stop there. Go ahead, Mr. Trask. Okay, so um, let's talk about the easements just so that you understand there are two easements. There's a re easement required from its not Rose Hill Cemetery, it's Rose Cemetery Association, Inc. That's the actual corporate name. They may go by Rose Hill locally, but that's not the corporate name. So it would be Rose Cemetery Association, and it would be given to the city of Tarpon Springs. That's shown as Exhibit B. You'll notice in the first paragraph of Exhibit B um, that it says, almost in the last sentence, um, it's gonna be the side, it talks about repairing or servicing a water main or other city utilities and the pedestrian sidewalk to be constructed and maintained by GGR North Lake Trail LLC, its successors or assigns, connecting the North Lake Trail subdivision to Jasmine Avenue here and after facilities. So in the very first paragraph, it says the developer is responsible for building the sidewalk on the Rose Cemetery property within the easement that they're granting. Also, the easement from GGR North Lake Trail LLC um, is similar in nature, and it provides in that first, uh, in the last paragraph under the grantor covenants, it says that the grantor shall, if directed by grantee, which is the city, 
construct a pedestrian sidewalk in the easement area connecting the North Lake Trail subdivision to Jasmine Avenue at its sole cost. The sidewalk shall also be maintained by the grantee um, and its successors and assigns. So those provisions, there's a provision in each easement saying the developer is completely responsible for building the sidewalk and maintaining it, just so it's clear that way. There was a little, um, you had a question, of, well, do we use the sidewalk fund to build it? No, these easement documents provide that they're gonna build it. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, I did want to answer one other question that was brought up last um, public meeting, and that was who's responsible for maintaining it? Um, and specifically because of the fact that Rose Cemetery Association, uh, we, we were told, had a concern about having the, the requirement to maintain. Under black letter law here in the state of Florida, the dominant estate, which would be the owner of the easement, here, the city, would be responsible for maintaining its own easement. The servient estate, which would be Rose Cemetery and also the developer's property, um, is not responsible for maintaining um, that easement area other than the specific requirements set out in the document. Here we know that they are specifically required to maintain that sidewalk after they build it. So, but they're not otherwise responsible for maintaining any other portion of it because they're the servant <coughs> estate. Th those are legal terms. I understand it's a, little, uh, uh, it's a little difficult to understand, but just so that you know, the entity that has the easement, the city, is responsible for maintaining. Uh, the only exception would be if there's some other written agreement by the servient estate saying that they will maintain it, or there is some activity that has occurred over a number of years showing that they have voluntarily agreed to maintain it and they have done it for a number of years. Obviously, neither one of those situations really occur. Um, and so we just didn't understand it's your easement, you'll take care of it. If it needs grass needs to be cut, you're gonna cut it. If there are trees that need to be trimmed, you're gonna be responsible for that. So hopefully that, those answer the questions about the easement. As for the effective date of the ordinance, um, we can add some language that says the ordinance shall become effective upon the following and address the adoption and recording of e executed easements as provided in section two and um, so long as the final site, uh, the final development plan is approved for this project. And then you've got it and you make sure that if they don't come back within a year, then the easement does not pass or the, um, the vacation does not pass. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions too. Any questions from the commission? Mayor, it's back to you. Actually, this is not quasi-judicial, so it's back to you. Thank you, thank so. you. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have any, anything else that you'd like to cover? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. We're gonna to go to public comments on this item. Any public comments, please come forward. Peter is 514 uh, Ashland Avenue, I thank Mr. Trask for clarifying about the maintenance because I know it was a big concern of ours. Uh, one thing legally, uh, when I look at this municipal agreement, it's based on the diagram here that's the same diagram on the back of the vacation and they're both identical, so my question would be, maybe Ms. Dabbs would like an answer, I don't know if she even thought of it, but Will there be a second easement for that back 15 feet of parcel or will this document cover the full easement all the way back to the sports complex? You can answer that later on your own time. Now, last meeting I talked about how years ago when we vacated property, we were able to receive fair market value. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the vacation, Vacation is 20 feet by 619.61. So let's just say 20 by 620. Multiply that out, that's 12,400 square feet. Mm -hmm. You divide that by 5,200 square feet, the minimum lot size they requested, that comes out to 2.385. So the city is giving Pioneer Development 2.385 lots. Indirectly, but you are. 
Now, they paid $630,000. You can look it up at pcpao.org. So you divide that by 18, that's $35,000 a lot. So at a minimum, at 2.385 times 35,000, the city should be getting reimbursed $83,461.54. I know it's not a sale, it's a vacation. Again, Mr. Trask can elaborate later on his time, those abilities. But here is where I really want to point some out. Previously, Mr. Stamis stated that these units would go for $400,000. So you take 2.385 times 400,000, $954,000 out of that gross. You assume costs to uh, build the houses $150,000 each, that's 300,000, maybe other expenses, engineering, such like that, another 104. So you take out 400,000 out of the 954, you're left with 554,000. Even if you bump that up another 10%, that would still give you half a million dollar profit. Thank you, Tarpon Springs. I wish I had that kind of deal. Any other public comments on this item? Okay. Hi, Craig Lunt, 743 Chesapeake Drive. Um, <clears throat> first, I wanted to thank uh, the developer for the accommodation on the sidewalk. That was good. Um, one of the things I'd really like to mention, though, is I've driven that area more than a few times since our last meeting and discussion on it. We need a sidewalk on not only the back street, but the front street there by the, uh, by the park. Um, it's... I mean, it may be more difficult to build a sidewalk over those concrete swales or whatever they're called now. Um, I don't want them to make a decision purely based on the fact that it's somewhat easier to build a sidewalk on the, on between them and, and Rose Cemetery um, than it is on the other side. Um, one of the things that was not also mentioned during our last meeting was, I believe in our budget we have $500,000 allocated for building a sidewalk around that field. So something's got to join that sidewalk. It's, it's purely a matter of the fact that we're going to be bringing people in to that area for the recreational field. If there's no sidewalk there and there's just that kind of depression dish with, with concrete swales, that does not make the city of Tarpon Springs look like the city of Tarpon Springs should look. It's going to be sloppy. We need a sidewalk there. It needs to be adjacent to the development across from the trail, even if the trail's there. And we also need sidewalks at both places because human nature means if I'm coming out of my neighborhood, I'm not going to walk another block down to the end to cross over to the trail. I'm going to do it there. And that's going to be an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Here none. Mr. Trask, before I ask for a motion, would you please explain the, uh, the ruling on vacation charges? So uh, a number of years ago, and I think it was in the early 90s, <clears throat> my uh, partner, John Hubbard, had brought to the commission a change to the code wherein he was suggesting that the code be revised to require some type of fair market value be added to the vacation process of when someone was to, to apply for a vacation. That code was changed um, to, to provide for that. So Mr. Delacus is bringing up um, the code provision was probably in place when he was in office. The law changed and there's case law out there that now that prohibits us from doing that. That doesn't mean that we can't charge a fee for the application process. Um, your code currently requires an application fee of $200, which probably doesn't cover the first part of the activity that's involved in, in doing this, and maybe that should be increased. But your code provides currently a charge for $200. That's the maximum based upon the code. You cannot charge for the fair market value of the property. H here's the reason why. You don't own the property. Uh, the property is a dedicated road right-of-way for public purposes. 
If you own the property outright with a fee simple ownership or by quit claim deed ownership, you would have the right to sell it and charge fair market value. But once, it's, um, once the property is vacated, you no longer have a legal interest in it because you didn't have one to begin with except for the dedication on the plat. The plat says it's dedicated for the public purpose, whatever that is. Maybe it was for utilities, maybe it was for sidewalks, maybe it was for roads, but if you vacate that, you you, uh, you divest your right of that interest in the real estate, but you don't own it, and therefore you can't sell it. Um, can I address a couple of other things, Mayor? Please do. Okay. Please do. So there was a question about um, the additional 20 foot for what I'm going to call is the toe of the property, the other easement on the back end. Right. That is going to be a separate document. Uh, that is going to be an access easement. It's not a sidewalk easement, and it's not a right. Of, it's not a utility easement. It's for access only on that end. So, we'll we'll be drafting another uh, easement that will be part of the approval process. That that will be picked up if both parties agree to that. So it's not necessarily included in these easements that you've got before you. So I, I I've answered the other questions that I'd written notes on. So, Mr. Trask. Um, you say that the city has no ownership on the on this land that is going to vacate. Correct. Okay. Is the city obligated to vacate the land, though? You're not obligated to vacate the land. You have criteria that it provides in the code where you can vacate the land, um, and that's the application that's come before you as a request to vacate it. Your code allows you to do that. Um, so, and you remember that when you vacate, normally that right-of-way is split 50-50, half to each property owner on each side. So that's really what's happening here. And, but you'll remember that a number of years ago, five feet of it was already vacated. So you're not getting the, Rose Hill is not getting the full. 50% um, of the vacated Yeah, full 50% because they've already got a portion of it in years past. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, com questions to uh, to the attorney? If not, we need a motion. He has some lights on, don't they? Uh, did, questions the to the attorney? Was, was the motion made? Not yet. No. Uh, we we haven't approve. been able to ask. Um, huh? We have not been able to ask questions yet. I'm sorry. We haven't been able to ask questions. I just had a couple questions for staff. Okay. We need a motion, though. Then you can ask the questions that you like. Motion approved. Second. On the motion, would you uh, add the uh, the additional language that was by the city attorney? Second on my part on the second, yes. Oh, uh, the, the motion. What I need clarity on what the city attorney, what you're even talking about. I'm not even sure what you're talking about. Mr. Trash, would you please repeat what you the additional language that you told us at the very beginning? All right. In section four of the ordinance, it's titled effective date of this ordinance. What my suggestion is is to change it to adopt language that would make it a, uh, based upon approval of the final development plan. So it would read something like this, and I'll wordsmith it a little bit better when we get to prepare the ordinance, but it'll say this ordinance shall become effective upon adoption and, and recording of executed easements as provided in section two and approval of the final development plan of, and then I put the project name. Do um, you agree with that, Vice Mayor? So accepted. And w the second as well. Commissioner Dobby had a question to ask. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think this would be for Ms. Vincent. I just want to know about the access. I know you, I know, uh, Mr. Trask brought up an access easement that's going to be drafted. Is that where we're going to be able to address who has the right to use that road? Correct. Yeah, it's the back portion, you know, the back 20 feet uh, right there where she's doing it. The other easement's going to cover the rest of it. The other easements that are in your packet are going to cover the rest of it. Okay. Yeah. And do, do we need consensus tonight or anything like that for that when, when you guys do bring that access easement forward to include some type of stipulation where we can grant access to a third party if they're hosting an event or tournament there or if they're contributing to the operations of the park or something like that? Um, the background on it is just that Junior Spongers and Little League Soccer have been using that road for decades really since the parks um, inception um, without any issues and that's just for like board members because it, it butts to the press box and a storage shed so 
they usually use it. They even had signs back there that said, like, you know, Tarpon Springs, the league president, that kind of thing. So is there is there an ability for us to have some type of stipulation in that access uh, easement to say, hey, you guys can still use it even if it's just on the weekends? So the answer is yes, and the easement could be drafted to that effect, but we have not discussed public access at all, with, at least I haven't, with a developer. So I'm not sure how that will be received. Um, so... We can bring forward when we bring the access easement forward the access easement ne won't necessarily come back to you it, it would be it would, i, I it would guess be it's something that we could take up with the final plan development i'm we, sorry we could probably address it during final plan development there you go we could do that then yeah I'm sure i'm sure they won't mind it's not the biggest deal in the world i mean it, it's it's been uninterrupted with no issues for i don't know 20 years well i think at final plan development we can you know we can maybe have those draft easements um you know ready to at least be reviewed and as part of the final plan development and hopefully we can work with the developer as well as um the cemetery to make sure that they're okay with with that between now and final plan development to for that remaining 20 feet okay do you want consensus from the board tonight or anything like that to at least approach the developer and discuss it i know we can't make any guarantees with commission this, donovan do you want that to be placed on the uh, on the motion as well i don't think that it can can, can it? they it's not part of the uh, this agenda item so i would i would say that we will make note of, we made note of it we'll make note yeah and it, it, we'll, we'll yeah. address it okay yeah thank you okay commissioner Tikuris, you have a comment the light is on no, I, I do for the city manager. Uh, Mr. LaCourse, I didn't get a chance to ask you um, outside this meeting, but I know you spoke to um, the Rose Cemetery Association concerning the maintenance and the other provisions concerning the, um, the vacation and then the easement that's being granted to the city. Um, it, Rose Cemetery Association is fine with everything? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I know Mrs. Dabbs is here as well, so... Okay, thank you. That's all. I, okay. I, Any my, other comments? Main, my main concern was the maintenance, and that was addressed. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Vadikiotis. Yes. Commissioner Donovan. Yes. Vice Mayor Carr. Yes. Mayor Lahusis. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, we finished with the uh, public hearing. We go back into item number eight. Number, number eight is the settlement of code enforcement lien uh, at the 1639 Seabreeze Drive. City Attorney, do you want to present this item, please? Yes, Mayor. So um, in December of 2020, um, and then again in January 2021, uh, uh, this property located at um, 1639 CB Drive was cited for a couple of different code violations. The first one was uh, Section 8-16 of the code, which is um, which requires that garbage containers be brought in um, uh, when our, they're not being picked up. But, um, this property owner would allow the garbage cans to remain out of the street for significant periods of time. It, it got to the point where it came to code enforcement staff as a complaint, and then ultimately. Um, there was no resolution by the property owner, so they brought the code enforcement and they were fined $50 a day for uh, the days that they were in violation of that particular code section. The, um, the second code case came before the code enforcement board because the property owner took it upon herself to uh, construct a driveway or a parking pad in the city right of way. Uh, she did that without a, obtaining a building permit um, the code enforcement board found uh, her in violation of failing to obtain that permit and building in the city right away without permission and find her $75 a day. Um, the third code enforcement case was a repeat violation case where again the property owner was leaving her garbage cans out at the street and she was fined $75 a day on the second go around. 
The property eventually came into compliance. It came into compliance by the garbage cans being brought in from the street and the parking pad was actually removed from the city's right of way uh, because it could not be permitted. Um, as a direct result of the liens and the significant amount of time that passed between the original code violation cases and the actual compliance, a fine accrued in the amount of $22,924.37. Once the property was brought into compliance, the property owner petitioned the Code Enforcement Board for a reduction of the big fine, the one on the um, parking pad, um, and it went before the Code Enforcement Board. City staff at that time recommended that the Code Enforcement Board reduce the fine uh, down to $5,500. Um, the Code Enforcement Board denied that request uh, the fine remained static at the 22924 Subsequent to that, we received a request from the property owner, um, entered into some settlement negotiations. I proposed uh, moving forward again with city staff recommendation of reducing it down to 5500 uh, but also so that she can address the other outstanding code enforcement liens, um, uh, which were about $1,000 um, or $1,100, I suggested her making an offer of $6,600 that would pay the, uh, all of the liens off. She did make that offer. Um, and um, so I'm bringing forward that settlement offer of $6,600 as a full release of the three liens, which total about $23,000 now in exchange for the release. In the packet, You'll see the photographs that were submitted to Code Enforcement Board. It shows the garbage cans out at the street continuously. It shows the parking pad as to where it was installed. And then the affidavits of compliance, uh, when it actually did come into compliance, uh, the payoff on the Code and three Code Enforcement liens, um, the Code Board orders where you could see where the Code Board actually uh, entered um, the daily fines. Uh, also, the request of the Code Enforcement Board for the fine reduction, the city staff's recommendation to the Code Enforcement Board, and then ultimately the settlement offer that followed my email to the property owner. Uh, the property owner is anxious to get it resolved. Um, in her offer, she said that the $6,600 will be paid out of uh, her proceeds from refinancing the property. She's trying to refinance the property now. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have, but the uh, request is, is to allow the city staff to um, take $6,600 in full settlement of that code enforcement lien. Thank you. We're going to go to public comments. Do we have any comments on this item? Please come forward. Good evening, Mike Eisner, 1515 Riverside Drive. Um, I've had many conversations with uh, Desiree, the owner of this property. Um, there are many places on that block that have parking facilities of rocks and loose debris that was getting into the street. Um, it was maybe her nuance or ignorance. You know, she did try to explain to me that she wanted to do something out of cement so it would look more proper. Uh, she had no idea that it would be such a, an issue. She even tried to make it a little fancy with bricks to put around it. Um, it was a innocent era. Um, she spoke to me about the garbage cans that have been in the street. She also suffered from a COVID attack and she was also suffered from a heart attack as she explained to me. And she didn't feel that it was, uh, you know, she, her two kids were not really as, as normal kids. They just didn't take in the garbage. It was just out. So, you know, I've watched a lot of reductions in uh, violations here and I kind of think she needs a reduction in violation as well. I don't believe that she did anything uh, <coughs> on purpose to break uh, laws or violation. Um, she is trying to refinance. She's a single woman. 
I've noticed that on Facebook she asks a lot of times for help with things in the house and um, she is a give back person. She tries to do a lot of good things for Tarpon Springs and people that are uh, needy. So I would really look to see that the board look kinder even than the offer of 6,600. Um, she is trying to refinance. She's in a bind. And these were the things she shared with me and I'm sharing that with you. So I would give you, I'd like to have some consideration for our fellow residents. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Here to Lax 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, I'd like to talk in regards to how it kind of got this way. 75 bucks a day because the garbage cans were out. I didn't see a lot of backup history about all the ordinances or stuff, so I can't really make a lot of assumptions. And uh, I was disappointed that uh, the issue of code enforcement didn't come up at the forum. Uh, they cut off the taking questions at six and uh, didn't get a chance to ask that. But I think this board or future boards does need to fully look at evaluating uh, how our code enforcement functions work. There's a lot of good. I hear compliments about things about Beth, and I've worked with her before. And, uh, but again, I reiterate that being that most of those issues are not police issues, they should be in a section of the building department or maybe something separate. And then, code enforcement board. A lot of these people, as Mike mentioned, the lady's having struggles, she's probably working. Two o'clock on a Thursday to come to a code enforcement board, they're going to take off. They don't, you know. Another board that maybe you need to have uh, meetings when their people are able to come, even a Saturday meeting. There's nothing wrong with having a Saturday meeting. And I know Mark and Mike are going to kill me for suggesting that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's about a little more fairness. And I got to say, sometimes. The code enforcement board, uh, it's more punishment than help. And I know uh, <clears throat> we need to revamp how we look at our code enforcement issues and maybe put alternative policies in where if people are having certain issues with their buildings, we refer them to a local union construction group that has contractors that will volunteer time to come help or work at a pro bono or a discount. There's ways to solve some of these problems besides hitting people with $7,500, $200 a day fines where they don't even have the money in the first place to fix it. So whether you reduce the fine, I don't know all the circumstances. That's not in my judgment. I just feel that this is an issue that uh, I hope the candidates going forward bring out and look at. And I'm sorry uh, we didn't get them on record to how they would like to handle these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other public comments on this item? I hear none. We need a motion. Motion to approve a $3,000 settlement for all three uh, liens. Second. Address 61639 Seabreeze Drive. Second. Okay. Commission comments. Vice Mayor Carr. I've got a question for either city staff or the attorney. Um, do we know the reasons why the, the code board didn't provide any reduced fines at all or what that looks like normally? I, I was at that meeting. There was no discussion. There's a review. Um, the Rule 5, Section 4 requires them to make their decision based solely upon the written petition and the response given by the city. So there's no oral argument. There's no presentation. Um, it's, um, that's the way that it's been in existence since the late 80s or early 90s, and that's the way most code enforcement boards do it. 
it's kind of uh, dealt with like an appeal. Um, so there was a review of the documents that were provided to them. Uh, there was a couple of minutes hesitation and then there was a motion made. There was no discussion on the motion. Okay, that, thank you. And if I understood correctly, uh, it was first brought up in January 21, but then the lien started about eight months later after it was first discovered that this property owner was a um, violation of code, I believe. So there were three code <coughs> violations, and no, there was not a six-month gap between the original notice and the actual fine. It was much shorter than that. Um, I, don't, I didn't have that background, but there were three liens. One was December of 2020. Uh, one was January of 2021. And then there was the repeat violation of the trash cans in August of 2021. Okay. So the repeat was eight months later. How's it work? I mean, I don't mean to get into like the, mm -hmm. the details of this one, but so when the code board finds somebody for trash cans out by the road, do you, is this something I need to talk to the city manager about or do you know a little bit more about it? Because I mean, you have two days a week where trash cans are actually to be out by the road. Do they not get fined those days then? So there is this code provision 8-16 is called pre-collection practices and it specifically provides when the garbage can goes out, when it can go out and when it has to come back in. And that's so that you don't have garbage cans at the street all the time. Okay. So that's what that code provision is, when it goes out and when it has to come in. Mark, can we put that in the Facebook page somewhere just to educate our community, please? <clears throat> um, We've got no further questions right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Commissioner Davi, you have a comment to make? Yeah, I would, I, I would just echo the vice mayor's thoughts. I, I just, I, I don't think code enforcement should be used as a, a punishment. I don't think it should be a punitive tool. I think the goal should be to get back in compliance. And I mean, frankly, this one's for, you know, one, one of the violations is garbage containers left by the side of the road. I think that's, I think that's pretty nitpicked. So um, I'm, I'm happy to reduce it some. Thank you. Well, uh, the court enforcement was designed not to uh, bring revenue to the city, but actually to bring the property into the compliance. Uh, yeah, of course, $6,600, uh, $6,600 is really uh, more than I can imagine, but uh, the property is in compliance. It cost the city $962, so even $3,000 to me, I think it's, it's more than enough. I think it's too much because the, uh, we have a resident with a hardship. Uh, I think we should reduce it to $1,000. So uh, I will ask the vice mayor if, uh, if he wants to modify his motion. I'll support that. What about the second? I, I think it was me. I'll support it. Second. Support it, okay. Any other comments? A roll call, please. Commissioner Vaticutis? Yes. Commissioner Domino? I'm sorry. Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes, thank you. And the last item on the agenda is item number nine, is a direction for a moratorium on apartments, Vice Mayor Carr. Vice Mayor, you want to present this item? Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot for me to present right now. Uh, city staff provided a nice backup for some ideas. I just want to bring it to the board to get some discussion um, to see if this is uh, any interest for the board at all. I know there's been some public comment about uh, different things going on, uh, obviously with the, the property in the Anklet River, it brought up some other discussions that I've seen in the public about um, apartments, multifamily use, um, with the comp plan being updated and some different things throughout the city. I thought it would be a good idea to potentially look at um, the current regulations that are in place for multifamily, um, is there some areas that we could strengthen uh, our code? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that would look like, but I at least want to bring it up to the board to see uh, if there's any appetite for that. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Craig Lunt, 743 Chesapeake Drive. Um, I really don't have too much in the way of comments, but I do have a couple of questions. The number one is, uh, why are we looking at this? 
And the number two is why now? I mean, just recently we approved uh, an apartment complex with a whole bunch of rancor and discussion and, and long hours into the night. And then all of a sudden, a month later or, or, or less, we're, we're looking at, at doing a moratorium on apartments. Um, the other thing being is, Tarpon Springs is growing. We need to bring people into this town. We need to bring affordable housing into this town. It may not be possible to meet affordable housing without multifamily dwellings. Um, I'm not saying that we should put them everywhere, but we need to find a place to accommodate this or Tarpon Springs won't be able to grow. Um, that's all I've Thank really you. got to say. I just, why and why now? Any other comments? Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. I have to say I agree with what Mr. Lump says. You know, we want tourists to come here. We want people to vacation here. They like our community. They want to come and live. Where are they going to find housing? People can't find housing now. We need the tax base in this community to keep the community running. We need the people to come into our businesses to keep our business community running. Let the people who are on the committee come up with something and at that time make a re uh, recommendation. But don't choke or kill the community with letting people come in to live in Tarpon Springs. Every day, people are looking to come here and live, and they can't find any place in Tarpon. Look at Clearwater, look at Tampa, look at Dunedin, and look at Safety Harbor. You say you don't want to be like other communities, but they're thriving, and they're building, and they're doing it right. Don't choke us. Don't kill us. Next speaker, please. Here to Lex 514 Ashland Avenue and to follow up with Anita and also with Craig, the thing is doing it right. I know we're fighting 404 apartments out there on the Anklote River, but that's for specific reasons. And just like we told Walmart, find another site. I talked to Camille months and months and months ago about a couple of sites to go find. And I agree. Affordable housing, but where do we put it? On the last pieces of vacant land? Or do we craft our ordinances and our plans and zoning districts such that we steer those type of developments into areas that need redevelopment and revitalization? I'll tell you, I told Camille this, and I'll tell you here right again. The southwest corner of Mango and US 19, there's a little four office strip and then a big L. It used to have vans back there. That's got to be at least 10 acres. So you put in 100 apartments in, or 80, or 50, whatever, and you manage it. It's, gonna, it's got access westbound to the Gulf, it's got 19. There are sites within Tarpon that can be <coughs> redeveloped. Same thing on the north side of the river. But we need to find stronger ways of getting transit out there for these types of development. But long story short, let's get back to the d information provided. Uh, planning department's recommendations are valid. You set it for a year, you put it, tie it to your comprehensive plan, and you have the moratorium apply to future land use map amendments, which increase residential density and a few other things. The only one I was a little curious about was the last one, uh, amendment associated with a required or voluntary annexation where no density or intensity increases will take place, but that's another thing. Now, lastly, in Mr. Trask's uh, email, there's discussions about timing 
and determining when the right to building permit vests is a primary concern. <coughs> he also mentions that uh, in some cases, uh, the vested right may or may not have been carried over or stuff. So there's a lot of things that you would need to look at with regards to uh, how to put that in place. But uh, I would say the best way to do it is to tie it with your comprehensive plan amendments and uh, look at where you feel you can offer uh, various incentives to redevelop property versus just going in and taking vacant property. What those mechanisms would be, I, I'm not really sure of at this time, uh, besides the usual one of giving tax breaks. Uh, I'm not sure if you can create a TIF in certain areas for those types of purposes. Um, there's also state plans, I think it's SHIP, that has plans where affordable housing can be built in certain areas. So there, I think there are ways to look to try to bring in the housing that's necessary, but without tearing out the last few remaining spots of our nature and what we treasure about being here. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Mike Eisner, 1515 Riverside Drive. Um, listening to some of my fellow comments i too don't understand why this has come about now um, the opportunity we had to um, deny this there was findings of fact that was delivered by commissioner vaticiotis the findings of fact were not delivered by the rest i just don't understand it i've always been against this project from the get-go um, i'm not for this, these type of projects here, period. But if it falls within our zoning, you have to allow people, I will give you that, to build what they want on their property as long as it fits our strategic plan and everything else that we have as rules and regulations. I listened to this entire case. This whole case did not fit that. It was still safety issues. FDOT didn't approve things. We're not talking about that right now. We're talking about this item here. I, I, but I don't understand why it's come about. That's my question. Well, do you have any recommendations in regards to a moratorium? That's what the question is. I understand the question. Okay, thank um, you. Stick with that, will you please? Okay. I just, I, I would like to have that go to the people, the residents, to make that decision. Thank you very much. Am I done? I thought you were. I didn't hear a bell ring. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. No, it's okay. Thank no, you. No, no, no. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Any other comments? I hear none. Uh, we need a motion. Do we have a motion on that? For discussion purposes, I'll make a motion to um, direct staff to look at some options for a moratorium um, that aligns to the comprehensive plan um, for uh, future land use maps that could impact uh, density changes, uh, increases, and then um, that follows some of the recommendations that, um, or follows the recommendations from the planning department. Vice Mayor, I appreciate that you bring in new ideas to the board. Uh, I think it's great. But um, I cannot support this recommendation that you bring in. Moratorium should be used for emergency situations, and I'm not convinced that we have any crisis going on uh, at this time. So a moratorium to suspend building apartments, to me, it makes no sense at this time. Uh, we all know that we're in process of working with our consultants to update the uh, comprehensive plan and to create a strategic plan. And any recommendations should be addressed at that time. And uh, again, as I said before in the last meeting, that I, yes. the last thing I want is to tie up the hands of the new board to be able to be functional, and which will become active in April. So with that, I cannot support your idea. And uh, Commission Donovan. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for bringing this up. I think it's worthy um, of a discussion. I, I personally um, don't support a moratorium. I just, 
I think it's too much of a blanket statement for unique properties and unique property owners and what they want to do with it. Um, so I, I wouldn't be in support of, of looking at anything that's going to be a blanket, you know, hey, we're no longer going to allow X within our city. Um, but again, I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I guess that's all the comments that we oh, have. Oh, wait, Mayor. No, I, I just see you late on. Um, I was a little confused because I didn't hear a second, to yeah, be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah, second. You seconded it, didn't you? We don't have a second. No. I'll, I'll second it for discussion. Oh. I mean, we're already, I that's all. I was just a little. Already two-thirds, but. Um, I, the, um, the, the, I, I do have some questions, though. I mean, um, I, I, Mr. Lund asked, um, um, you know, why and why now? And I think Vice Mayor Carr um, answered those questions. And, and um, I, I want to be constructive about all of this. The, um, um, and if I understood correctly, basically because of the apartments on the river and things like that, that was a, a somewhat of a, a traumatic effect on the city. And maybe there's some interest in, in preventing that in the future or something like that. I, is that or something uh, along for at least having a discussion right now, not necessarily that that's what would happen, but at least to have a discussion in that regard. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of public comment that came out saying we don't want to see additional apartments, okay. not necessarily about the land itself, but just apartments. So that was just a discussion. I no, no, that's, that's good. I, I mean, I appreciate that. And, and um, um, some of the stuff that, uh, and I do have some notes here that I wrote um, and I have given this some considerable thought because initially I, I wasn't sure what this was about or anything. And I'd spoken to the city manager and, and uh, he wasn't um, given um, any reason or anything. And, and I just uh, felt I, I wanted to ask you about it this evening, but also I wanted to give it some thought ahead of time. And um, if I understand correctly, um, the memorandum that um, Ms. Vincent uh, put forward it's not necessarily this is what you're recommending but it's just if you if the commission does wish to proceed these are perhaps some of the ways to proceed is that correct correct okay um, the, the one thing that I that does bother me a great deal and and this has to go back to the Anclote Harbor project but but it's relevant to what we're talking about tonight is that um, and, and it's tied to the update of the comp plan as well. That project and all of these projects these days are being approved on a comprehensive plan that is pretty much 15 years out of date. And at that time, when those provisions were put in there, the city was only about 60%, maybe 50% built out. We're over 90% right now. So I think that those provisions would look drastically different in a comp plan if it was updated today than it would um, have been 15 years ago whenever this was, um, um, whenever those provisions were put in place. Um, we don't have an updated housing mix. I think the, co the housing element uh, right up front says that the, um, that the city will take a policy of allowing the free market to determine the housing mix or the type of housing that would be um, constructed. <coughs> Uh, again, maybe that was good when the housing, the, the city was about half built out, but I think we need to have a little more concern um, over it uh, being over 90%. I think we need to be a little <coughs> more specific about what, what would work for us and what doesn't, whether it's affordable housing or some other uh, attainable housing or some other aspect of housing. Um, the, um, and also, um, I think that we're talking about apartments and, and maybe um, there should be some similar discussion concerning family housing, uh, multifamily housing, I guess I should say. Um, the, from a practical perspective, um, I mean, those are some thoughts. From a practical perspective, and I think Ms. Vincent in her memorandum provided um, a basis under certain conditions where a moratorium would be um, uh, desirable or at least constructive with regard to helping us with our comp plan. But from a practical perspective, even if we gave the staff direction tonight, um, in all likelihood, the second reading 
wouldn't come back until there's a new commission sitting here anyway. You would be here, Commissioner Carr, and I may or may not be here, but the rest of us aren't going to be here. Um, the rest of, other than you and myself, are not going to be here. So I, I'm, from a practical perspective, I'm not sure why, I mean, I'm not sure why that it would be practical to proceed right now and, and, and put this burden on, an up, on a new commission coming forward. So I think that may not, that by itself may not be a, a good idea to proceed forward. Um, but the, but I do know that there's a rational basis that Ms. Vincent provided. And, and to give you an example, the one thing that um, Ms. Vincent mentioned, and, and I'm glad you brought this up. I know maybe people are wanting to go home and stuff, but this is important to me. Um, I think it should be important to everybody, to be honest with you, given the fact that these big projects are being approved with plans that are 15 years out of date. Um, in Ms. Vincent's memorandum, it says that any future land use map amendment which changes the overall land use category, uh, for example, a change from an industrial category to um, residential category. Now, in my opinion, in my opinion, there's a nexus there between what was done, what is here, and what was done in the Anclote Harbor. And I'm using Anclote Harbor as an example. I, I don't want to relitigate that this evening. But the Anclote Harbor project did not go through a land use amendment. It, it used somewhere embedded in our land development code the option of a conditional use, not a land use amendment which if we had gone through a land use amendment, it would have added an extra set of eyes, primarily the county, which does have more stringent requirements, specifically with regard to uh, coastal high hazard areas, and maybe they would have shed a different light on it, a stronger light on it than what our PNZ board did um, of recommending denying the project. So we missed out on that. So I think, in my opinion, um, and of course, for smaller projects, they may not be a big deal, but larger projects like Anclote Harbor, I think we provided uh, a shortcut uh, through a doorway that was wide open, and I think that kind of doorway on a major significant project like that needs to be shut. Um, ABR was mentioned. I explained about ABR, the 1,200 jobs were halfway built out, and the need for that at the forum, I believe I said that, or at least it was the Rotary Club form, um, but on a, um, it, it, the, 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 the ABR development was actually a development of regional impact. That would have actually gone to uh, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council and handled through the state, yet we did everything on this 74 acre site internally here to the city without allowing anybody else to have a, f a, a set of eyes on it, which I think was, was uh, a, a, a something that I didn't care for because we had the opportunity to get some help on this and we didn't, we didn't take up on it. Um, I think that, um, I, I think that's pretty much it. I, I had some conditions that if we were going to pursue a, uh, a discussion or directing the staff to uh, create some kind of a, an ordinance in the future or something like that, there would be some things that I would lay out, but I, there's no support for it. But I do think very strongly that, um, that, there, um, um, that we should be very careful with what we do in the comprehensive plan with, with regard to these projects. I'm hoping at some point We'll get a map showing what our, our properties are that are developed that would be subject to um, either a uh, conditional use or by right for multifamily of anything one, one acre or larger, that sort of thing. So we can actually see um, how much property we're actually talking about. We don't even know that right now. Now I'm hoping that's going to be part of the comprehensive plan process. Um, the one thing, though, that was intriguing was um, with regard to Anclote Harbor. Um, I, there, is, there is some potential that that does come back to a future commission, not necessarily the one sitting here, but in the future. But I'm hoping that by us not moving ahead with anything this evening doesn't have a, um, 
uh, unintended consequence, if that does come back, we're still gonna be looking at that project with an outdated comp plan. So that would be my concern right now uh, in probably the real value of, support, of submitting some kind of, um, developing some kind of a moratorium, not for the general purpose, but the fact that we are dealing with an, uh, an outdated uh, comprehensive plan, and there's a good possibility that we're gonna get the um, uh, Anclote Harbor project back again in front of us, again, with an outdated comprehensive plan. So that would be my, my rational basis, if you will, along with some of the other more general things that uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Vincent brought up tonight and the fact that I didn't care for um, the, the fact that uh, at least part of the property required uh, a, con a land use and it was done through a conditional use of uh, going from a, con from a commercial general, I think, to uh, residential uh, multi-use, so multi-family. Um, that's the problem I'm having and I'm, I'm hoping this commission recognizes that. I'm gonna give this some more thought and because of um, it doesn't make sense to start anything this evening and burdening some future commission with it, um, if I do prevail in the future and I'm still here in April, this is something I may be I may bring, uh, may bring back um, with a future board uh, because of the uh, the, the situation we may have be, be face, facing at uh, facing uh, the um, the Anclote Harbor again with an outdated comprehensive plan. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I've seen it. We don't have any other comments. Roll call. Just for clarification, if you vote yes, that means you want the moratorium. If it's no, you don't want it. I'm, I'm sorry. I think the, the motion was for discussion, wasn't it? Well, we still have to, you know, we still have to vote on it. Okay. We're, we're, what? The easiest way is, Vice Mayor Clark, could you repeat your motion? Yeah, please? I mean, the motion was to um, direct staff to draft some type of moratorium based on staff's uh, backup. And um, I did say for discussion as okay. part of the, as That's part right. of it, so. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to decide yes or no to it tonight, so. Okay. And second is good, right? Yeah. All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Vatikiotis? No. Commissioner Donovan? No. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Larizis? No. That concludes the regular session agenda. And we go to staff comments. No comments, sir. Okay. Uh, city Attorney? No comments, thank you. City Manager? No comments. City Clerk? No comments, thank you. Vice Mayor Carr. Mark, we've got a couple hours left. The light, light agenda. <laughs> uh, appreciate all of the staff uh, support and preparing all the backup with everything that's done. City Attorney, thank you for uh, your emails and information as well, too. You're welcome. Thank you. Commission Donovan. No comments, thank you, Mayor. Commission Vaticuris. I have no comments. Well, that concludes the regular session meeting. It's adjourned at 9.07 p.m. Good night, everybody.